Like Fortnite specific. I think he, I think, I think he did that classic local movie again, what? by the way, where he just, like listen, he didn't listen to the no, no, stuff. I, I just, no, I, I, I've learned. Listen, after last episode, I've learned I have to be the one to let things go. I can't actually tell local like this is a cul-de-sac. I have to oh actually like, put the child lock on okay. and just drive out onto the highway again. So we're onto the highway again. Anyway, local, I, great right. point in your own way. You know, opinions are nice to have. I told you um, in the last episode. Sure. Right, this is going to be episode 77 of Listen Loco. And being as seven is the divine number, I believe, of completion, we decided that this is obviously the way to complete the series that is Listen Loco. <laughs> Welcome to the last ever show of Listen Loco. We've finally come to the realization we need to enter divorce counseling. Mm. We will be transitioning <laughs> towards being separate hosts of shows. In the divorce, Loco got to keep all the eagles that he hosts afterwards. <laughs> I got to keep all the straight fire banter and knowledge of how to run a show. And I'll now be boring all of you to death with my usual cadre of people who are really knowledgeable about the game. But even I sort of tune out halfway through and then I just try and tune back in at the end. Like, uh, yeah, 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 fucking reckless. Yeah, hate that guy or something people want me to say. Anyway, this episode is going to be... By the way, like, I, I'm almost tempted to just keep that part as a joke there because I know there's people who just don't get you who believe it was real at Sarah, so... But whatever, I ruined it now. I've sort of revealed the Wizard of Oz. You, you should know. have just gave it five seconds silence. I that should was... have. I should have. Yeah. I should have said we should do a moment of silence for the show. That's know? all we would have whatever. Taken. Anyway, so this episode is actually quite a unique one because if people notice so far, unlike some of my other shows, the premise that we do for Listen Local is we decide the region first and then we try to get a guest for that region. So even though Rich is from Europe, the concept here is not actually to only talk about Europe or LEC. In fact, I don't even know how much we'll talk about LEC, we'll see. But since Rich, when he worked at H2K, was obviously, people might remember, I think it was about three years ago, they put out that article before franchising happened that basically were the first people to push for the idea of European franchising. Because Reginald and those guys, they said they needed it in NA and we heard it was coming. And then people like H2K basically came out and said things like, when you run a European team, you run at a loss. You know, there's no real way at the moment to make the money back. Like, we need concepts like franchising potentially. I can't remember whether he was pro or for it against it at that time. But this was kind of the discussion. And so I know from some of the things I've seen him tweet that because he's in a position now where obviously H2K is not in the LEC, he can potentially tell us some of the insider stuff from the industry and give us a kind of an experienced point of view that I actually don't think right now most I don't think there's almost anyone else could give it actually because even the other people who used to be ex owners etc a lot of them came, like disappeared way before franchising or only were in the industry a year or two anyway which to be fair has never stopped half of those guys talking out their ass thinking they know everything but you know then again if I could con someone to give me thirty million maybe I'd also think I was a clever boy I could only get a few hundred dollars at a time. Right, Rich, here's the first question. So did I actually mischaracterize that? Because I know some of your recent tweets sound like you actually think there's like a lot of flaws with franchising. So what was the original H2K premise when you guys came out with that article, kind of basically kind of complaining in a justified manner about the finances in league? So I think um, I share like a fairly traditional viewpoint as like a guy from the UK who's, you know, really into football and other traditional sports. Um, like a really big Counter-Strike fan as well, where in a perfect world, I like the open circuit model. Like that's my favorite model, the concept that you have uh, more important and less important tournaments, you know, storylines culminating in majors and stuff like that. Like that And you can change is... how many teams are in a certain tournament or relegate, promote, etc. There's obviously a European sure. sports tradition for people who don't know if they're Americans. Exactly. <laughs> so the, 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 my ideal world is... Uh, you know, it's kind of like Marxism to communism, I guess. Like, I love for League of Legends, the idea of this sort of, uh, this kind of format. But the reality was, and the thing you're referencing, we were actually pushing for franchising. And that wasn't so much out of a want for franchising rather than a need for franchising. Because obviously, uh, video games in general are relatively finite, right? Like, there's no way of knowing how long a game's going to last. Absolutely, yeah. um, whereas football, they might tweak the rules or whatever, but there's, you know, always going to be a, a hundred by hundred and ten piece of grass, and people are going to run around on it. Like, uh, yeah. So we wanted uh, franchising as a protection mechanism for our investment. Um, I believe that it's 
incredibly difficult to start up conversations, particularly with non-endemic companies who even back then, you know, knew even less about esports than they know now and trying to convince them to invest in you. And I'm not just talking about investor investors, VC companies and the like of it, but just for sponsorships. The first question they ask is like, yeah, that's cool. You say, wow, you're in <coughs> LCS. What was LCS at the time? That's cool. But what if you get relegated? Like, why are we going to put our name to something we don't understand at all? We don't know how good your players are. Okay, yeah, great. You went to Worlds last year. We have no idea what your turnover's sure. like. We don't know. We don't even understand what a meta is. So your players who are great this year, we don't know if they'll be great next year. Why would we invest in you, sponsor you, when there's no security blanket whatsoever? So, yeah, as I said, I, I can't speak... Um, completely for the uh the the mindset of the other investors at the time but from my perspective i didn't want franchising but we needed it right it was like a necessary evil for where league, yeah. league of legends and also to be fair you always have to add in when you talk about league of legends games right i always say this like half the suggestions i nowadays make in my videos about how like they should structure msi or leagues etc i even say in the video since I know I'm in a game that is owned by Riot Games and they've made very clear kind of their preferences, I don't bother suggesting stuff like, why isn't Worlds a top 16 only teams in the world, full double elimination? It's like they're never going to do that. So at this point in time, it's only worth suggesting things, as you're saying, that at least come within the frame of reference that they might do or they might be able to be reasoned with or kind of brought a little bit over to one side. So, Loco, as someone who... I mean, I hesitate to call you an American because obviously you're Korean, mm -hmm. but you've lived in American culture a long time. You're obviously wearing an NFL, NFL jersey there. So you'd followed American sports. I'm guessing you don't follow European soccer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, actually, from an American's perspective, do you, uh, you are, and you haven't worked, or crucially as well, you haven't worked in a game that had a big open circuit, except at the beginning of League of Legends when mm -hmm. you were in Frost. So, like, is it something you're ever aware of? Kind of like that you you, you guys kind of like live in the bubble of just like that's how sports are. You know, they're a league. You always have the same teams. They can mm -hmm. never get relegated. They're there every year. The league shares the, the profits, for example. It's another thing that doesn't exist in football. They share some profits. But if Real Madrid makes loads of money off jerseys, they keep it all, mate. Like, mm -hmm. that's just them make loads of money. And then, you know, 19th best team in the Spanish division probably makes fuck all. So what's like the American perspective in that regard where you're coming from? Oh, damn. <clears throat> for like the franchising aspect as like a league fan and as i guess and like an open circuit aspect as well yeah for i'll, I'll just for, say from my perspective my viewpoint on franchising changed a lot like initially i loved it i heard our salaries would be doubled i heard like things would be more stable i heard like people can make more long-term plans and i worked on teams majority of my life or majority of my career so it meant more long-term stability it meant more long-term planning and it meant more money so I, I liked it a lot and i think as like american viewership and one thing that people one thing that league did struggle with is teams being stable like whenever a team gets into the league and then they get relegated or whenever an old school team gets relegated there's upturn of viewership and it wasn't great in terms of building like fan to team fan to player relationship so there was a lot of the positive aspects that come with that but also hmm, how to say about i'm not sure about the future of franchising that's where i have like the most question marks about and when we talk like i think the league franchise <coughs> is the most healthiest i think overwatch is propped up artificially i don't i i can't even imagine how call of duty is going to do and even as someone like that worked within teams and for, for just just for clarification for people who don't know the reason why local says that and it's kind of a given that most people in the industry would agree is because an overwatch and and call of duty they don't even have the viewer base to really support their leagues like at least league has like a nice viewer base that's susta sustainable has been there for years and years probably still isn't big enough yet to make loads of money but you know it's way ahead in that regard than overwatch even though overwatch has actually had more money invested in certain teams than probably some of the league teams i i, I I think uh, that this is actually like what you said is obviously completely correct, but I think at its very uh, foundation, one mm -hmm. of the biggest problems with uh, franchising, well, it's twofold. One is what I would call like the original lie of esports, which is like how big esports is in oh, general. Like esports is nowhere near as big as people think it is, and particularly in the West, or I would actually say largely in the West, because the Chinese numbers mm -hmm. are more than comparable to traditional sports. But these lies that 
people people who've been in similar positions to mine on teams and in riot and everywhere where you know we put out these ridiculous graphs about the viewership numbers taking all the asian numbers as well by the way and being like oh did you know that world's 2017 exactly. had the the whole of world's 2017 by the way <coughs> had more viewership than game seven of the stanley cup final the nhl by the way being a very peripheral sport as it is anyway in 90 percent of the known world so uh, like it, it's just how we and also decided... like you say if you were showing that number to an advertiser and he invests in you when actually 80 percent of chinese viewers will never see his adverts i'd consider right. that purely unethical as well i i mean but th this is <coughs> this is the reality of how sports uh esports was presented and to yes. some extent still is presented sure. and that's why there's so much tension and friction uh which obviously most people don't see between you know uh owners of teams versus investors that they brought in and so forth i mean obviously the i assume you've both seen like the latest interview richard did with rick fox mm, sure. and obviously th that guy that rich is talking uh that rick's talking about in his case is obviously he's just one of the absolute worst humans you could possibly imagine but people like that in his position who aren't as you know fundamentally nefarious are going to be at your throat anyway uh as soon as you know these huge promises and ludicrous graphs and piece of information that you propped up your entire pitch and the entire reason for why they're investing yes. show themselves to be at best ludicrously inflated and more often than not uh just just uh, based on 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 lies so that's like the first issue the second issue is whether or not conceptually you're for or against franchising uh i think it can go either way as i said my default position <coughs> is against franchising but that was an assumption that knowing how Riot work and operate and what they want to do within the confines of franchising, we felt that it would be far more likely that we would get some of the things that we wanted via franchising. I think there's a, a big misconception right now, for example, that like, oh, H2K applied for franchising and you didn't get in. Ha ha ha. It's like, what, what do you think we we're applying for? Because I, I genuinely don't know uh, what, what the deal was that we we're applying for. We applied for the right to negotiate to be in the league if anyone in their right mind believes that any team uh any team with a brain would apply blind and be like whatever deal you give us we're going to sign it we want to be in the league we're applying to be in the league so if it gets accepted ergo we are going to be in the league and we're going to sign that piece of paper like absolutely not all the uh public Wait, statements and Rich. announcements and everything that we gave mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. Can I ask about that? Because I felt like yeah. most teams couldn't survive without LCS. Like, it's a little bit different now, but a lot of the big orgs nowadays, like TL, C9, TSM, like... Well, here's the thing. He he basically implied, like, the opposite in a way, locally. Yeah. What he implied was they were losing so much money without franchising that mm -hmm. even if they didn't want franchising, it was still... It, even the logic of let's just bleed less was mm -hmm. kind of the mentality. That's why a fanatic might just say, fuck it, just, we'll take whatever terms you say. I mean, I wasn't think that... such a big part of like all these like original orgs, like even in Europe, like Fnatic G2, like where losing that league fan base and like exiting league would have been also like, I mean, it's kind of shit. It's a shitty situation where it's not a great choice yeah. either way. You're right. Yeah. I mean, if it, I would, I'll, I'll just give you some, uh, you know, objective examples, which you guys can, and the audience can like look up themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Fnatic lost 1.1 million in 2017 on League of Legends. Mm -hmm. It's on a company's house. You can see it in the line numbers. Mm -hmm. um, they lost over 3 million since 2016, just on their gear peripheral, which they were obviously using LCS and other ventures to sort of prop up and promote yes. and market. You know, these companies are losing the obscene, obscene amounts of money on League of Legends. So just because something is the cornerstone of your business model doesn't mean that you had a good business model in the first place. Anyone sure. who bases their business model around uh, the LCS or LEC being profitable in the short term, it's a, it's a failed business model. The reason why... Fools errand. Right, exactly. The, the only profitable, uh, profitable organizations that I'm aware of have actually based the core of their business around completely different things. For example, TSM, who, you know, they're one of the oldest, the most associated with League of Legends of any of the teams. They're also one of the first to smartly diversify and identify where the real money is made in esports. And sure. one of those is streaming. And now if you were to add up all of TSM's assets, they undoubtedly make a lot more money through their streaming than they do from League of Legends. Uh, and, you know, the same for a company like FaZe. 
phase is first and foremost a lifestyle brand right like yes. they're not i can tell you actually someone from phase basically told me i'm not like betraying a conference it wasn't a secret he basically told me streaming is the business of phase having yep. the teams is like a cool thing on the side and also you get to have cross-pollination of you know a streamer who is a pro like they you basically just straight up told me that's the, yeah. he said that's the business basically is streaming yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I would guess that uh, I think you can get to a balance where esports can be good for your company. I think that FaZe's association with esports and how they brand in themselves, like, sort of validates some of the sort of cool factor that the brand is predicated on. But sure. I think when you're in a position where League is front and center, your main money getting asset, that business model historically has absolutely failed and to me there is nothing to indicate based on the style of agreement that the teams have with riot that it will ever do anything other than fail okay. um so i think that a lot of, i would say that a big reason for why this has happened uh in i'll, I'll stick to europe because i'm i'm more familiar with yeah, how sure. the lec thing was done um it's it's as simple as people made stupid decisions you had uh X amount of teams to apply for franchising. By the way, something that people seem to have forgotten about already are the teams that said no. North were offered an LEC slot. They looked at the contract, laughed, and said, can we have this instead? Riot said no. They said, see you later. Movie Star, same thing. Slightly different reason. They weren't allowed to use their name, which, uh, you know, I guess would put off <laughs> sure. anyone who's built a brand. Like, oh, sure. really? I can't use my... Yeah, okay, yeah, see you later. And, you know, the, the teams that said yes, I can't, I can't really <coughs> speak for them any more than they had all of the facts and they're hoping that... I'd even imagine, someone... like, sh surely there was also for some of them, like Loco says, with a fanatic, there's almost at that point the sunken cost fallacy, right? It's like, why have I spent millions and millions and now I'm, what, I'm just going to give it up and have nothing right. for that? Like, that's probably a factor, right? And the result that happens is you see uh, these very uh, sort of mis mis misinterpreted by the community pieces where it's like, oh, Fnatic Series C fundraising. They've raised... Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Rich. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, Fnatic, like a Series C fundraising, they've raised... <laughs> um you know 25 million more dollars and everyone's like oh my god fanatic raised 25 more million dollars things must be going so well it's like no that my favorite mate is always really when they badly, go, by the way it's, it's when they go haha now they will buy faker for 15 million it's like you are the dumbest motherfucker on the planet whoever says that like that <laughs> oh here's yeah. the thing though right there's a lot to unpack there rich so <clears throat> did you have like a final closing part to it before we no but it? i mean i i, I, I just I was kind of linking it to how i i also kind of don't like how the organizations are willing to Oh, they spin the fuck out it. of it like, to, to present like, a lie, yeah. Yeah, like Ocelot, is, you know, I remember reading the headline, it was like, oh, he's done it again. G2 raised 30 million. It's like, yeah, you're losing loads of money and you need more money, we get it. But like, the, because they know that the 13 year old fans don't understand the first thing about business, they think, oh, wow, G2 must be super successful. No, they're, there's almost a correlation between how successful you are and how much money you're losing actually in esports. Team Liquid in NA, an obvious example. They yeah. paid the most. They have the winning record, but they're losing the most money as well. And we're making yeah, it. Paid by Steve is hilarious. It's like uh, this guy, not literally maybe, but you know, in any kind of traditional business model, is unbelievably in debt. But because of how they structure the organization and this guy pays himself a big salary, which, you know, in my opinion, someone with a conscience shouldn't do that until you've actually put the company in a position to make money. You know, it's it's one of the most ironic memes going. Oh, so right, there's a few things here, though, local, mm -hmm. right? So like, I'll just got a couple of points and then jump in on whatever you want. Okay. So first of all, when he said before the original lie of esports, there's something that's never spoken about, right? Because what's crazy is I was obviously there from the beginning. I saw the first ever pitches, companies coming in, sponsors. And I can tell you the way they used to sell esports is the same as now. They've just tweaked the lie to be more believable. So what happened was in the early days of esports, mm -hmm. this is how they would get a crazy number. Mm -hmm. They would literally say, Loco, the entire Hollywood movie industry, I'm going to make up a number here, makes $9 billion per year. The entire gaming industry, except they wouldn't say entire game, they just say the gaming industry makes $15 billion per year. Mm -hmm. They then wouldn't qualitatively analyze those two statements. They would just leave it to you 
to get tricked and think, well, 15 billion is more than nine. Not pointing out that esports was a fraction of online play, which was an incredibly small fraction of gaming, which doesn't even include the fact we're talking about PC gaming or console. Like, you know, obviously, like every copy of Final Fantasy VII has fuck all to do with Quake in a tournament. So in the early days, it was the most extreme version of the lie. They literally took an enormous number and they didn't include point out that the part that was relevant was incredibly infinitesimal. And we're talking billions versus like maybe a few hundred thousand mm -hmm. in revenue at the time. And all they did over the years is just tweak the numbers because obviously it would be totally implausible if you said that now. So I'm going to instantly break that down. But if again, all you have to know, this is the key trick. You just have to know what the investor doesn't know. And anyone who tells you, by the way, main people will tell you this, esports lawyers who work for these people and get these deals, they'll all tell you, no, 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 Thorin, that's nonsense. There's no investors who aren't doing, doing their due diligence. I'll tell you how you do your due diligence. If you're a normal investor, just investing some money and you're not like buying in directly, you personally into an org, what happens is you go and you you pay an expert to audit the, the industry. Mm -hmm. So you go to Morgan Stanley and you say, I'll pay $10,000 for this report you've written on what the Overwatch League is going to be like. And you read that report and you think, Morgan Stanley, it's a very respectable financial company. They know all about business around the world. Whatever they're telling me must be appropriate. And within the report, by the way, they structure it in a way that looks very reasonable. They have the, the base case, here's what esports is currently. Here's the bull case. Here's what it could be if it goes really, really good in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Here's the bear case. If it goes badly, here's where you'll be. I can tell you, I've read that report, and what was the base case isn't even... Uh, what they put as the base case should have been the fucking bull case. Like, we aren't even where the base case was. And then as a result, if you can follow what I'm saying here, what they put as the bull case, where the Overwatch League would be in 10 years, mm -hmm. I genuinely think whoever wrote that should never be allowed to work in any kind of an auditing or like expert-based financial market again. Like they absolutely, I mean, I, I guess I have to say allegedly, or in my opinion, lied to the people who bought that report and probably misled a lot of people who, like I say, thought to themselves, well, this expert must know what he's talking about. I've literally paid him to know what he's talking about, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's that angle, which, like I say, it's definitely gotten better over the years, but still you see a lot of bullshit. Like he's saying there where you add in the Chinese numbers. I'll even throw in as well a, a detail some people don't know mm -hmm. is those Chinese numbers are not even fucking views. They, are li they literally operate on a different system on Chinese streams where sometimes the number at the bottom that goes up mm -hmm. is like some weird mixture of like viewers and social interactions and fans doing almost like, like rich, the, uh, yeah, or cheering. Yeah, something weird like that. Like it's not actually raw viewers, but what happens is Western orgs take that raw number and the best ever local is my native game, CSGO. Mm -hmm. They will take an event that had 200,000 viewers in the West, maybe real people, and they'll say, and the Chinese stream was 800,000. And it's like, I've been to China. I never saw a fucking person who knew what Counter-Strike was. This is nonsense. It cannot be real. Yeah, okay. It cannot be real. And so, that, first of all, there's that aspect. And then on the other aspect, like he was saying about um, the franchising model aspect, like there's there, the key distinction Loco he made was that let's compare two orgs, Fnatic and FaZe Clan. As he mm -hmm. just said there, Fnatic is not a profitable business. In fact, it was losing millions. And you may remember this story where I actually exposed that because it came out that G2 were giving the owner, well, one of the owners of G2 gave a loan to Fnatic, the terms of which said, if Fnatic default on the loan, he owns Fnatic. He would have owned two teams at once. And cause Riot just fucked Monty on the logic that if you ever have any kind of a promissory note or a contract that says in the future, someone becomes an owner, you're treated now as if they're an owner. That's the rules by which they were able to fuck Badawi. So as a result, I pointed out, this is utterly hypocritical if this loan is allowed. And if you remember the meme that came out of that was, Riot basically just went like, it's okay, we will reverse the loan. So I made another video explaining that there's no such thing as reversing a loan. That's mm -hmm. like, that doesn't, that concept doesn't exist. Then the second part is, so there's Fnatic for you, right? Mm -hmm. It makes sense, local, you're right. If they've invested that much into League, if, if they have the best players in League, it doesn't really make that much sense if you believe esports is going to be big one day mm -hmm. to bail now to them. They think, no, no, now's the time to double down. Now's the time to buy into the depressed market. And in the future, I'll be fucking super rich when I am Real Madrid, right? Then the other side of the equation, this is the key thing. You know, he said there, look at the teams who turned it down. Mm -hmm. I'll go one step further. 
The teams who are profitable in esports aren't buying into franchised leagues. Where the fuck is FaZe Clan's LCS spot? Where is FaZe Clan's Overwatch League slot? I can tell you where they are. Banks, one of the head people of FaZe Clan, went on a podcast. I think it was actually like No Jumper podcast. Yeah, it was. And he said on this podcast, why would anyone buy into these leagues? Because what he pointed out was the other lie of esports, which again is to conflate the games. So what you say if you're an industry professional in esports is... I am very bullish about esports, which means I believe esports will get big one day and, and grow in terms of financial aspects, right? What you don't mention is esports growing and being something huge in 30 years means nothing if you invest 100 million into league and it dies in five years. You don't get to have any of that on the future of esports. You got you lost your 100 million on whatever else you put in, and that's it. You don't benefit from that. That's a very clever sleight of hand that people love to play in esports to this day. So all I'll tell you is this. I know from League this is true because I went to the big League of Legends owners and said to them, why don't you have an Overwatch League slot, by the way? Like, couldn't you get one? And they told me, literally, if there was a franchise league I believed in, I could get as many slots as I want. I could get unlimited, like, they literally told me if there was five franchise leagues that all cost 20 million, I would be able to get the investors, based on my business plan, to invest in all five leagues. So if I haven't, it's because I believe in LCS more than Overwatch League. So in that scenario, anyone who thinks that like fears would have been declined, I don't think you've been looking where the industry is at the moment. Mm. The big, big, big odds that, like he says, already make money, they're not in a rush to throw that money down the drain, mate. The ones who are sort of already on the hook and can't escape unless they lose everything from the past, they have to do it. Mm -hmm. They have to. Damn. By the way, there's there's a exception, a singular exception to um, how this was kind of working in Europe, which is... And this is kind of like the irony of how Riot advertised or what Riot advertised they were looking for from partners. Because obviously, Immortals, for example, were denied. Um, yes, LCS. when you look at some of the LEC ones, there's no way their deal was worse right. than Immortals, right? So, so <clears throat> Immortals, undoubtedly, Immortals was losing a ridiculous amount of money probably horrendously run and bizarrely are allowed back in now no one's I, I heard i heard two things i heard two things that all their money a lot of their money was going into overwatch and riot thought overwatch league isn't viable and maybe some jealousy included and the other thing i heard was they didn't like know winston i'm not sure which of it is true you know my joke there Very would be local. Mm -hmm. i would just say to riot could you just give me three reasons why the overwatch league will fail mm -hmm. and then i would take the reasons and then i would just chalk out at the top where it says why the Overwatch League would fail and just write LCS and that turn it back and go, did you see that? I, you have a look at that, mate. One of the most primary reasons why I think Overwatch League isn't as legit as League is, like, Overwatch is, like, they just injected money into it. Like, Overwatch didn't exist, and then they made the game, injected money into it, and then sure. turned it into a League, where League of Legends, yes, there was money injected into it to become franchising, and a lot of inflation happened then, but it was natural. It was homegrown. And I still believe in League of Legends to so a fact. Or, yeah, no, sorry, I was going to say, so mm -hmm. uh, League league right now is financially not remotely viable to, if you're on the team side, not remotely viable, but it didn't have to be that way. Even with Riot's restrictions and the way they set up their partnerships or whatever, it's very mm -hmm. Riot-sided, right? Mm -hmm. But you still had teams who were making it work in its infancy. Unicorns mm -hmm. of Love, for example, for the entire time, the Unicorns of Love were mm -hmm. involved in the LCS, they were profitable. They were actually profitable. They were mm -hmm. the only profitable <coughs> team in LCS, in EU LCS. Obviously, they couldn't get into franchising because they couldn't raise the capital. They were a family-run business. And despite actually kind of being one of the more endearing brands because of their story, because they were homegrown, mm -hmm. they had a unique brand and were actually making money, Riot were completely unwilling to bend on anything because, you know, or oh, you don't have the 10 million, you don't get into the league, whatever, that's their prerogative. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the moment when the League of Legends financial were just completely fucked, and to me, this is honestly like his legacy in esports, is when Noah Winston came in with Immortals. Like, the, I can tell you that the difference between how much money we were putting in versus how much money we were, well, not getting back, but how much money we were losing, it was manageable. It wasn't great. We weren't profitable. But there was a very real possibility that we could become profitable with how the salaries were increasing back then versus, you know, how much money the players were demanding. When you have a guy who comes in with uh, the first real VC investment, an irresponsible, naive child who offers players 3x what the next 
highest paying team is pay is mm -hmm. paying and then demands that everyone make their salaries public and suddenly like everything's thrown up into the air and it's like wait what this really good guy noah winston is paying all his players 20k even though everyone else is paying people 5k yeah that's gonna really fuck up the ecosystem by the way like it i think Hooli appreciated never... it <laughs> well yeah i'm sure i'm sure he did <laughs> <coughs> why don't you want players to get paid for 20k a month brilliant but for everyone else it we it never recovered from that moment onwards it just got worse and worse and people were saying you know oh it's just a bubble it'll burst the bubble that was three years ago the Damn. bubble still has not burst from... three years ago and people were saying don't worry ride the wave it's fine it's really not fine because all my players are now asking me how it's okay that a guy that plays lucian top is getting 20k a month and i can't pay them more than whatever like it it's it never recovered prices kept going up and all that happens is what i call investor carousel when then people start panicking and try to get out and then they just blag new investors give them all the fudgy numbers and the fancy false graphs they then buy in they put by the way rich money. have you never noticed that what i would say one of my strengths as a journalist i've often pointed this out but mm -hmm. it sounds weird is i'm very good at noticing when someone mentions a b and d i'm the one who notices that where was c wait a minute why is no one mentioning c that's weird no one's talking about it so i'll give you a great example here rich anyone who has a business that one day will be incredibly profitable doesn't give a fuck about the overall investment numbers, the profit, what they care about is their equity in that business. Yeah. And that's why they will literally go to war over 1% equity, even when the company's tiny. Because of the the logic is, when it's a billion dollar company, that 1% is worth a lot. Mm -hmm. And it might be worth battling someone and even paying someone, by the way, more money now in the short term to make sure they don't have to get equity and you make it on the back end, right? So think about this logically, mm -hmm. Loco. If any of these teams that have taken 30 million and paid 10 million for an LCS slot were making money, why the fuck would they give away more equity? Mm -hmm. I would never give away the equity. I'd even be going the other way and saying to my current investors, like, you know, since it hasn't gone where we said it would so far, I'll even buy your equity out. I'll buy 2% back off you. Because if, if you were making money and you have the capital to do it, mm -hmm. the liquid capital, and in the future it's going to be billions, you want all the equity. That's why, to add on to the Team Liquid angle, I don't care, by the way, if they get mad about mm -hmm. this. Listen, I'm always going to tell the truth about this industry. Fuck with that. Oof. Is Team Liquid might go, ha paid by Steve. If you knew how much fucking equity that guy's given up, I think he's a great businessman in terms of getting players to sign, in terms of some of the deals he's done. In terms of the equity, you can actually look at someone like him and say, he probably actually fudged some of the numbers a little bit. Like he went, he, did, he was a little bit too early selling some of the equity, or he was too aggressive with the amount he was willing to get for the equity. So <laughs> some of those companies aren't as in, they aren't, that's the other problem. Because unlike, as he said, where you can go look at Fnatic, because Fnatic's a UK company, mm -hmm. you can go to a thing called Company's House. Mm -hmm. It's a public database. Same in Denmark, by the way. Denmark's even better. Because in CSGO, the reason me and Richard are fucking bashing on the top of Refresh's baseball fucking cap is because in Denmark, it's even better. You can literally see the financial reports. You can see that they lost $7 million last year or something ridiculous like that, like on their fucking series, etc. So as a result, in these countries, you can just check and we wouldn't even have to have this debate. In America, you have to just guess. And by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, that's a fucking feature of the system, not a bug. Mm -hmm. All right. So, oh man, my two cents on everything. So I actually watched the same podcast as you did, the one that Banks was on, but I watched it for different reasons. Oh. By the way, I'll just say, I was actually impressed. I've always seen Banks because I've only ever seen people making fun of him and I don't know Call of Duty. I've always seen him presented as an idiot. He had literally- He is an idiot time. Sharpest, he is an idiot. He had one of the sharpest takes on franchising I've actually seen of anyone in the industry uh -huh. publicly, keyword publicly. Mm. There's plenty of smart people who privately will admit to me all this shit, but publicly they'll sell you the lie that Rich said, like, oh, look, the Overwatch League just struck a great new deal. It's like, mm. and then that makes people think he made profit, you know? I know it's in the Overwatch League, Rich. They don't even use the word profit. They just say revenue. Yeah. I, am, <laughs> I, I, watched... I mean, just to, just to Matt, like, think of the state of the meta that Overwatch has been through in, like, the last, I don't know, let's just call it six months. Sure. And this is like, <clears throat> this is like having a, ta a, meta, a meta dispute. It's having a tangible effect on people's interest in the game. Basically, here's the analogy, right? Million dollars. Mm -hmm 
to get in to franchising and Overwatch. Basically, think of this yeah. if you're in League, because I know people don't watch Overwatch. Imagine next year in League, so we've all signed our teams, mm -hmm. right? Maybe TSM goes big and they buy fucking Yankos and they get someone as a support who's super sick and they have a sick team and they're thinking, fucking hell, this is our time to win. And then all of a sudden, this couldn't happen in League locally, but it did in Overwatch. Imagine all of a sudden, the game for season 10 is a game where the mode is three tanks and three supports. And I've just spent all my money on like sick jungler, sick fucking AD carry, and, I, and then it's three tanks. And by the way, that means loco. Mm -hmm. This is not a joke. In Overwatch this year, the best DPS players in the world, the equivalent of your Cristiano Ronaldo, mm. your fucking Antonio Browns, they were playing the fucking Go. flex tanks. They were playing the, the role that used to be like the guy who wasn't so shit in terms of aim. He was the tank. He was like half a tank, half a DPS. Like they literally were that limited mm -hmm. and it decided the entire league. Mm -hmm. All right. So going back to the bank stuff, yeah, well, come on. I, know, I watched that podcast because... Um, him and Alyssa Violet broke up recently, and it was because Banks had a past history with Tana Mungu, and he said it on that podcast, so that's why I watched. Hilarious that we watched the podcast. Gossip Maybe he is a bit of an idiot. <laughs> Maybe he is a bit of an idiot. Maybe he doesn't have that great taste. I don't know. What did uh, Jake Paul do this week, Loco? <laughs> they, got, they got married. They got married to Tana. Did they? Yeah. Like, did they? I saw that some news that said that they, there was no official license obtained what, by the what's the fallout from the contenders games loco <laughs> i didn't watch i didn't watch okay wait wait let's go back to the franchising thing so for me i actually had ownership in the challenger team that i was working with gold coin united um i was able to get investors and it, it wasn't easy but the whole like the dream of franchising is this is going to be the next sport like this is what people are going to be interested in and one thing that esport does and why the traditional sport teams are really interested in esports they see how much money traditional sports makes and they also see this trend of the traditional sport fans getting incredibly older and the newer fans not coming into traditional sports sure. like you see sports like baseball baseball and football have this problem the biggest. NBA is actually somewhat fine, but for baseball and football, their fan base, the average fan base is so much older. And there's this um, demographic of young, like this young demographic of 20 up and below 35 that people are trying to reach desperately with advertisement and they have all this spending. And the best way to get at them is esports. Like this is what a lot of us care about in this sure. demographic. So. I mean, that's the franchising model. Like in the future, like all these franchises are going to be worth millions, maybe even potentially, hopefully. yeah, hopefully, potentially yeah. billions. Well, what, sorry, which franchises are going to be worth billions? He, he means that in the premise of yeah. the franchising model, like he doesn't mean like literally that he's saying TSM. He means like the concept of what they were sold on is that, you know, one day they'll, even though you lose okay. now, it'll be worth it. You know, obviously that is the dream that we were sold. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. I can't see how it can happen because here's the problem, local. Mm -hmm. And I want to get Rich's take on this, actually. Even though I did present the case earlier, I even said this many times, mm -hmm. that the LCS slot, for a start, it's half as much money, and also it already has a better viewer base. That that makes it objectively better than the Overwatch League. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the concept of the entire businesses, it also cannot, cannot, I'll say that one more time, cannot, based on any current metric known, ever make that money for those players. They'll never make profit. I'm right. League will never make profit. Oh, I don't, don't get, I'm not saying it's likely, but to play devil's no, no, advocate. I'm just, I'm just saying it to like the audience, yeah. To play devil's advocate in the future, that's the dream, right? Like that's the yeah. dream that Overwatch and that's the dream that LCS is selling. Sure. Like in the future, like all the money you put in is going to be pennies compared to what this league is going to be worth. Like that's what, like that's the dream. Yeah, but here's selling. the problem. Like mm -hmm. I said, if you look at the metrics, so one of the main metrics is viewership, right? Mm -hmm. Well, wh why would the viewership for League ever get to even millions? I mean, it's a millions for worlds, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like for LCS, it's like fewer thousand. Mm -hmm. Maybe it goes really well. It's like 500K or something. Like why would that ever, like I, like what would happen? What what move would have to happen in the world that would make league viewership? Because that's the key thing. It's not yeah. esports. You're right. For esports, I think one day it'll get there. Mm -hmm. But for league, why would league viewership ever go high enough that we can all afford to invest like 50 million in LCS? League, I, honestly, like it would have to be something crazy. Like League 2 or League of Legends high school program picks up so much where the generation after us also cares about league. You've nailed it. Basically, they would have yeah. to, every few years, not only keep League's ecosystem alive, but do the equivalent of coming out with a new Fortnite every two years and getting every 14-year-old in the world to play it. 
So like that, that's not an easy task. That's the reason why also the new lie as well, Rich, is you just take all the Fortnite numbers and you say that's esports, and then it turns out you're a CSGO team. It's like, oh, that's reasonable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to the point, like this is a question that I asked and got a hilarious answer from actually in a in a riot meeting. I just asked like one of the riot execs. I was like, uh, what is your long term strategy in terms of like if a random game dev just brings out League? but it's better or like better graphics and it's just newer and updated runs more smoothly just more intuitive just literally every aspect of yeah. this game that's brought out is better what then and i was like are you guys planning on doing league 2 obviously i'm assuming if we apply for franchising we get in we're going to be part of whatever you know league 2 is that would obviously be like yeah they're not they're not that greedy that they would be like hey you have to reapply it's a new game but they did not have an answer their answer was literally we envisage league existing for like the next 15 years and by the way 15 was the number they actually used they didn't say forever or a really long time or will adapt as you know they said you know at least 15 years well sorry but if i'm paying 10 million to get into your league and i'm definitely not getting an roi in the first like five to seven years if you're telling me the lifespan of the game is 15 years and that's just a random number that you've thrown out there which i assume has some kind of connection to your actual personal opinion on how long you as someone from riot thinks the game's gonna last why am i going to pay 10 million dollars when i know i'm gonna be pouring cash into a hole for at least the first five to seven years and uh, i don't think i genuinely don't think they even know the answer to that question you also have the issue of skins right mm -hmm. riot uh, league of legends is not a paid game it's a free game they make however uh, however much money whatever the percentage is 80 90 percent of their money comes from skins Sure. If you make League 2, are all my skins going to seamlessly convert? Uh, obviously, you know, this is could be a potential issue for a new Counter-Strike game or something like that. But sure. um, uh, but the, the, the other thing, which because I've heard other people talk about this argument, I'm not the first person to bring it up, but something that I haven't really heard people talk about, if you do like that we bring out a new game every two years or whatever, what happens if, for example, I don't know, Faker isn't as good on the new game? Like... People, you know, instinctively, someone might say, oh, who cares? Oh, the next person. But no, it really, really matters. Actually, it actually did happen, by the way, in CSGO. When CSGO came out, aside from the fact it had a lot of problems as a game, it was actually a very small game when it came out. It looked like it was going to fail. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, loads of the 1.6 pros who tried to play it were just never as good because it was even though it looks the same it was yeah. fundamentally different enough Markelov mm -hmm. Markelov Neo mate Neo was the best player in 1.6 yeah. and when he came to CSGO he has never been close to the best Del Pan. Yeah. I mean like, Starcraft 2 Starcraft 2 is a great example where a lot of the Star well. a lot of the Starcraft 1 players tried to transition they couldn't and the players that were good in Starcraft 2 were called Thurgoji Thurgoji means um chores it means like because these yeah. were the players that used to do chores. Well, the practice partners and shit. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're the practice partners. And they got when StarCraft 2 came out, they transitioned earlier and they were good at it. And so they're like, oh, this is a game for the chore boys. Like, that's what the tier one StarCraft players used to say. But yeah, it's like in, in CS, obviously, um, way back in the day, these guys, as good as they were and as renowned in the scene as they were, obviously it wasn't on the same scale or scope as sure. you know someone like Faker. But yeah, hypothetically, if League 2 comes out in two years from now, Bjergsen's rubbish, Caps is rubbish, Faker is rubbish. It's like I mean, Bjergsen's is already a... there, but I get, I get well, your point. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, it's like uh, I was trying to think of someone decent from NA. You know, it's a yeah, short well, list. Double F. Uh, so yeah, it's, thank it's, God you it, didn't say Frog in. It puts He's a from massive. Uh, yeah, it, put, it just puts a massive. It puts a massive dent in the immediate interest and the conversion, and it's like. I, I don't know. I think you kind of have to, in a way, sort of remarket the whole thing again. And like, I just see the bottom line as games are finite. Like, I don't think the, the level of delusion in League versus the level of delusion in Counter-Strike, for example, is so night and day. Everyone in CSGO knows that a new CS is going to come out at some point. No yes. one has ever said otherwise. And people talk about things like that openly. In League, it's never discussed. It's always like, we're riding the wave, we're riding the wave. You know, when shit hits the fan, I guess it hits the fan, but no one's talking about it. Oh, the problem wait. is you have to talk about it when you're buying into a franchise. And the most, just to make mm -hmm. a final point on that, this makes Call of Duty, who do literally release a game every single year, paying, is it 25 million, I think it is? Dude, oh, uh, no. wait, Call, Call, of Duty. Call of Duty is so fucked. Like, Call of Duty franchise, I, that's one franchise. I can, I, I'm pretty sure Overwatch will not do well. I think Call of Duty will absolutely 
fucking bomb. They don't have the viewership for it. They have to constantly come up with new games. And also, like, at least League and Overwatch, when they sell to sponsors, like, we're not selling, like, here, like, you get guns, and then you go kill people, and then there's terrorists, and then, like, things blow up. Like, we're not selling war to children. Like, for Call of Duty, like, that's, like, the pitch that they have, like, that's a pitch they have to get around when they sell to sponsors. Like, there's no way Call of Duty franchise does well. That's one franchise I absolutely refuse to believe in, and I think it's an absolute fucking scam. Anyway, I mean, make your point, Rich, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I agree with that, because CSGO is technically, yeah, I, like, a I have some reasons. Sim, right? Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I, I just think that, uh, I mean, it's very obvious, you know, why the Call of Duty one's happening. Blizzard are like, oh my god, people actually bought our Overwatch slots. This is unbelievable. Think what a cash grab we Basically, get. Basically, Loco, the, what it's like this is, imagine, you know the famous joke when you meet someone gullible. You say, if you believe that, my mm. family's got some nice, uh, like, bridge property in Brooklyn mm. that will sell you. And the joke is, I don't own that bridge, do I? If I sold mm. you it, then you're an idiot. Well, the joke here is, CWL mm. to Overwatch League is like, I sold you the one bridge. And I go, you know what? While you're here, mm. I've also got a subway system in Greater New York I can sell you as well. It's like, that's the joke. It's like they're just tricking mm. them again. Mm. Uh, then they, they uh, as far as I know as well, I haven't had this 100% confirmed, but I believe mm. this to be true because somebody came to me privately and they asked if I could find them an investor for Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. And I asked what city they'd been offered. And mm -hmm. the city they gave me was uh yeah it wasn't new york it wasn't la it was a very who cares about this place kind mm -hmm. of city and i asked them what the price was and they told me the same price as la and new york and i'm just like i mean this is just nuts but again the the only way these things happen is is via either mm -hmm. the 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 peddling of the lives of esports or the relationships um that Activision Blizzard, the higher ups in Activision Blizzard have with some of these people who have bought in. Like Robert Kraft, for example, is involved uh, in, is going to be involved, I believe, in like the Call of Duty franchising. This is not out of smart business acumen that he's come to this decision. It's I'm literally a billionaire and I'm essentially buying favor with my buddies who I assume will reciprocate that favor at some point down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just absolute madness. And the thing is, like, it's so damaging for the space it's so damaging because we always talk about how the goal is to reach the mainstream and you know esports needs acceptance we even try and make the massive leap that esports is actually real sports or should be considered as such and you know treat us the same and blah 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 and whatever and all anyone is going to see from the non-endemic space is a bunch of idiots making terrible decisions sinking millions if not in the totality billions of dollars on uh, fruitless endeavors and why should anyone with any genuine business acumen take the space seriously and honestly they shouldn't they absolutely shouldn't if someone came to me and said hey i'm looking to get into esports i've got shit loads of money what do you think i should spend it on i would say find some kind of connective brand that you believe you know appeals to gamers or that kind of sector and then maybe you can make esports part of that but if your primary model is actually esports itself I cannot recommend you anything which will see you get a return on your investment in the near mid or long term future. Mm. Obviously, it could, but I'm certainly not going to tell you that it could. Um, and by the way, just sort of uh, anecdotally, when uh, my a group of American investors came into the space um, in 2015, uh, I met with the first thing I did was met with a group of um, guys like people who i still to this day consider to be the absolute top experts in the space for evaluating like the finances of esports um and we put together like a business plan something we thought was viable um and this is what we presented to them and we fully nothing was inflated nothing was um you know no, no numbers were blurred or anything like that we said we believe that we can let, get this return on by this date and that was our best guess and we told them that we thought, you know, there will be huge risk involved, that Riot will be a massive hurdle potentially. Um, we can't guarantee some of the decisions they will make or not make, but this is what we believe uh, is our best guess. And we were wrong. We were just straight up wrong. And we told, we, me and the same group of people went to them sort of nine months later or whatever, and we said, you know what, our projections for 2018, they're not going to be what we said they were going to be. And the, the investors that I were dealing with were very, you know, understanding and accepting of that and because we'd fully explained how we'd arrived at our conclusions mm -hmm. 
they saw it as you know understandable mistakes and that was like dude that's like the best case scenario the best case scenario is that you can fail and you were transparent about it but that's just the reality of the team side unfortunately most people aren't even transparent about it so they just horrible horrible there's nothing worse than being in a position where you're basically responsible for someone else's money mm -hmm. that money is just vanishing before your eyes and you're being dishonest about how and why and what you can do to turn it around it's just the ultimate digging yourself a sure. hole and most people i don't even believe that most people do it on purpose or that they're bad people no, no. or whatever but this you know it, this happens with so many times with so many esports organizations and then you ha have these high level conflicts where you know people get at each other's throats and legal suits are thrown at each other or whatever because it's just a horrendous position to be in and you know i can say for myself like in in an esports capacity i would never again put myself in a position where even if i felt i had the best possible available information where i was responsible for other people's money in the esports space because i on on the team side because i can't see a light and i would not be able to to assure them of anything other than a slow bleed or a fast bleed. Oh, I'm sure. Speaking way, of, on, the, okay. on the topic that you, where you were said earlier, Loco, mm -hmm. about like, you know, games like League don't have like the violence element and mm -hmm. terrorists. For, there's two things to say about okay. that. One, the most popular game in the world right now is shooting people with guns. It's mm -hmm. just because they're cartoon guns, magically mm -hmm. that's fine. Oh, no, no, that I'm, shows where American culture is fucked. I'm not saying that's okay. Yeah. You know, Lawson, mm -hmm. I've told so many journalists this, and it's actually blown some mainstream mm -hmm. journalists' minds. I say this to them, right? They say, what do you think about... Uh, being part of a violent game. And I said, oh, sorry, I, I don't know if like, English is your first language, but you're actually absolutely incorrect. Like there is no violence involved in Counter-Strike whatsoever. It is purely a fictional game. There are no real guns. There's no mm. person ever gets injured. Meanwhile, I say to them, would you ever describe the NFL as a violent sport? No. And yet people literally get concussions and have their fucking heads smashed in, in that sport. Now you notice you can sell mm. America's fucking game to everyone. You can tell, get, sell the Dallas Cowboys to every kid in the world, mm -hmm. even though their hero is getting his fucking head mm -hmm. smashed in every week. That's not a problem mm -hmm. because of how it's framed in the media local. Okay. So the day they want mm -hmm. to make it like Fortnite and mm -hmm. say it's not about shooting people, it won't be about shooting people. Second aspect, mm -hmm. that's the mistake, actually, you've unwittingly stumbled across as to why games like Call of Duty and Counter-Strike have got a real problem. Mm -hmm. Because yes, a lot of 14-year-olds play those games, but if the lie of esports was correct and there was as many people played, you'd never market to them. You'd market it like the UFC. You'd say, of course we're shooting terrorists. We're fucking adults. We're having a glass mm -hmm. of whiskey, a cigar. We're playing some games and we're playing with the boys, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You'd go that angle like the UFC. The UFC doesn't like fucking like use CGI to cover up the blood or something and go, well, we've got to get kids on board. Like, no, they know there's enough adults in the world mm -hmm. they can appeal to make a fuck ton of money anyway make your point local i you have to admit <coughs> selling a game with guns and like people dying and like bombs and terrorists to sponsors if i don't want to get into the conversation of like is it violent like is it ethically right my point is it's much harder to sell to sponsors when the game is like that and when like the core gameplay aspects are like shooting people like Fortnite specific. I think, he, I think I think he did that classic local movie again, by the way, Wade. Like listen, he didn't listen to the no, no, I, I just, no, I, I, I've learned listen, after last episode, I've learned I have to be the one to let things go. I can't actually tell local like this is a cul de sac. I have to oh actually like, put the child lock on okay. and just drive out onto the highway again. So we're onto the highway again. Anyway, local, I uh, great point in your own way, you know, opinions are nice to have. I told you uh, in the last episode. Sure. Here's the thing though, we we've got a bit of time left mm -hmm. still. We'll do like ten or fifteen right, minutes. I, I do want to talk about the Call of Duty part. So yeah, let's do it. why I think like the Call of Duty League is a fucking scam and why I was on my phone earlier. So I'm on this site that gives you stats for like the viewership, right? Where do you think Call of Duty, um, Call of Duty Black Ops It's very Ops low. 4, I know it's a very, very low game in terms of viewership. Give me, give me a benchmark. Like, I'm going to guess 70k, 50k. No, no, no. In terms wow. of ranking, in terms of ranking of games, like on Twitch. Oh, I would say 12th. 12th? 12th maybe. Yeah, 10th. 10th? It's the 20th most popular game in the last seven days. Let's do 30. Like it's gonna go, it's gonna go down and down. Like, why is there a franchise made for a game that's less popular than Super Mario Maker, than Minecraft? To like, be fair though, one of those games might have been the. Uh, uh, I don't know if the, I think I think Worlds was a few weeks back, a few months back. The like Worlds for CWO. But anyway, mm -hmm. one thing I'll say, local, it's a mm -hmm. joke, obviously. Is to be fair, one of the things ranked above Call of Duty mm -hmm. will be like cute gamer girls selling the fucking. <laughs> 
I don't know, their fucking ass juice and water in a bottle. Like, Make a franchise a around people... that. Like, there, At least there's viewership for yes, that. Yes, Belle Dufine, a franchise league. <laughs> I could make an obvious joke because there's a term I could use, but I won't mm-hmm. because I don't but... want to be in a Kotaku article tomorrow. But, but Loco, mm-hmm. did, did you just look at the last 28 days of uh-huh. viewership on Twitch? Let's go even I mean, further. If there wasn't a, to- if there mm-hmm. wasn't a tournament, then mm-hmm. obviously okay. it's going to be low because it's not like a popular community game, right? I still like, think it wouldn't be very high, though. Like, I agree. I mean, like, like, ours was like more re- where I would expect it to be, personally. Yeah. Right, so I'll, think... do, I'll do the last year, and let's see where it's, it's going to rank. So... I mean, like, look at Counter-Strike figures during a major. It's mm-hmm. like twice double anything else, but it probably sure. sits at like fourth or something most of the time. If you do the last year, it's the 12th most game. 12th most popular game. Okay, so what's Orange? By the way, mm-hmm. I'll even... Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll even say on the side, mm-hmm. in my own game of Counter-Strike, we have plenty of bump, bump kiss numbers as well. Like, for example, like he said there, the numbers for a major right, mm-hmm. don't make sense. It's the same teams that were at the tournament before. Mm-hmm. So why, because you put the word major, would people who don't watch Counter-Strike come and watch it? I'll tell you why, Loco. Mm-hmm. Literally, a feature they put into Counter-Strike was if you ever... The famous map that this happened on was Cobblestone. Mm-hmm. If there was a game on cobblestone you might randomly get dropped a fucking op skin mm. so you know how many people just sat there watching every game on twitch to find didn't off, actually yeah. care. they just thought if i get this op skin it's worth like 500 dollars or something so that's like you, you're not telling the sponsor that's why some of the people are on the mm. stream like if i'm coca-cola your million people don't seem as appealing if i know half of them are idling just wait for a fucking drop and they're not even watching the broadcast you know yeah i, but I, think, I exaggerate uh, with the half there by the way i'll just I give think, you one big game change like something that counter-strike and people can debate whether or not it was a good thing or a bad thing or whatever mm-hmm. is that since riot blacklisted stuff like uh alcoholic sponsors and betting sponsors mm-hmm. for a sure. long time as particularly like when betting was rife in counter-strike i i'm personally of the opinion that actually that betting was a good thing i i actually felt that because you know betting slightly different from like oh the the drops in chat or whatever because you are actually watching the game yeah. and like yeah, more it makes you invested yeah right people used to literally the say rich there was even a sub for it that was like csgo betting tips and what would happen yeah. is people who played counter strike they were for counter strike fans would go there and they'd be like right guys who's gonna win this match like vp or navi because i want to bet on it but like they actually in a way it turned them into fans yeah, I agree. Not, not, not even that though it's like <laughs> oh you're watching like heroic versus big or like two te- two teams sure, you would never normally teams. watch yes and then you're like, oh, cool! Like, I'm I'm gonna bet all my skins and see what happens. And you know, it, yeah, everything's just uh, like the intensity's elevated. I I I was kind of sad when uh, To started to sort of outlaw it like one by one. And sure. I don't think it. I don't see what it helped. I don't see how it helped the industry. And I think like esports needed. I think that was one of the gateways actually where you could legitimately yeah. legitimately make esports profitable in the longer midterm because for the obvious reason for people who don't know who are fans if you have a betting company and by the way some of these were unregulated betting companies that had no government oversight these are literally like the joke term that people use is it's a license to print money your yep. costs are incredibly low and you're just getting everyone's money. Mm-hmm. Like, what a fucking amazing business that is. So if you're talking about a scene like we're talking about in esports that lacks money, it has to bring in outside money. If you could generate within that scene basically a force of money. Now, obviously, Americans don't really like the moral angle of gambling, which is ironic considering all the other fucking degeneracy that country's <laughs> famous for now. But we'll put that to one side. It was a way to make money actually endemically within esports. It was a real business. And I think you had, it, and every side was getting fed as well. Like yes. uh, the tour tournament organizers i mean teams like fanatic was sponsored by daffabet like it was all encompassing so there weren't any real losers apart from you know the kids losing all their skins with uh, mummy's credit card but you know and some of that was funny yeah vic- victims in uh victims and all <laughs> I, I think exactly just due to how franchising is and the kind of people that are involved and the kind of money that's involved like i don't think betting and the franchise leagues will coexist maybe if like franchising actually does fall on its face do you want a prediction sure i've got a prediction for you if within the next five years they overturn because they've already started it already it just hasn't gone state by state if Mm -hmm. they overturn the rules about fantasy betting Mm -hmm. here's my prediction Mm -hmm. one company will literally do maybe even a billion dollar deal with the lcs or something like that because Mm -hmm. again they are licensed to print money and they would make so much it would be obscene how much they'd make so that's where all of a sudden riot games a company with strong moral values in it oh sorry was that your face like that's where they'll all of a sudden change their tune again and then a listen local sponsorship (laughs) 
It's oh, the don't one worry, mate. We'll, we'll have a 200 k sponsorship. I guarantee you that will be Woo! fucking ball out. It's the one Let's last go. possible bastion and ray of light, actually, for leverage for ownership of teams. If uh, if the regulations do change and DraftKings come in, mm -hmm. um, then you know as there's still not going to be any kind of broadcasting deal, this is like the one major yes, deal. that's the chance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I mean, if you if you invest hoping for that, then... Mm. And by the way, I'll say on the side, that's something we as Listen Local are very open to, is not unorthodox sponsors. Like, I could see a segment right now. Oh, we're going to talk about NA now, Loco. Let me put on a Durex condom. Don't want to catch anything when I talk about this shit. Oh, my God. Like that, there's loads of angles. Oh, what's that? We're going to talk about Echo Fox. Swig of Maker's Mark. Well, this will get me through the day. Hmm, warm, and it keeps my secrets. You know, what do you think? Like, this would work, mate. I'm like, it's smoking a cigar the whole time. I fucking oh love that shit. I'll be I all mean, over it. Tinder are already in esports, so you could have a section with Loco talking to his honeys, I guess. Oh the problem God. with that is, I don't want to see the inevitable scenario scenario where when Loco's Tinder account gets investigated by someone like the whole you know the scandal that could follow that first of all I'm going to be tainted by that bitch like I'll, I'm associated with this guy now so all I'm telling you is this I'll tell you this Loco this is both a joke and a real statement right? because I have some friends in esports yeah. and CSGO events that we go to all these events around the world yeah. so obviously especially back in the day they were loving fucking Tinder because you go to the new city you get a girl that you meet up oh there you have a cool date so here's the thing I even told them I actually have a rule if I, I'm not on Tinder anymore, but when I was on Tinder, you know, because you use Facebook to log into Tinder, yeah. it shows you that feature where it shows you shared friends with someone yeah. like a girl that you're looking at. I said, if I ever see any of you motherfuckers there, that's an instant swipe no. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck what she's like. I don't care how nice she That's a swipe no. The, the fact that you know her and she's your friend, that's a no. That's mm. a no. Damn. Have you ever swiped no, Loco? Me? Yeah, all the time. I'm very picky. <laughs> Okay. All right, here's a question though, like because one thing I wanted to ask about was one of the things you said on Twitter, where mm. another aspect, kind of like I alluded to with the Overwatch League, where they love to announce deals they've made, Rich, and the revenue that it's making. So you made this point about how deals operate in the franchising model of LEC, I think it was, right? That when right. the money comes in, because the concept was supposed to be, Riot's going to sell these big sponsorships. Remember, they even were going to get this like whole department in that would do it, etc. And then from getting those sponsorships, it would be shared among all the teams. Like, what was the what was the thing you said about that? Right. So, uh, I I actually think legally I can't say exactly how it works, but I can give you the basic premise, yeah. which is a uh, so let's say all teams bring in sponsorships and Riot also bring in their own sponsorship. Basically, every gets everything gets put into a same pool and then it gets divvied up. However, the divvying up percentages are very uh, riot-sided, let's say, to like an insane degree where actually we worked out when we did our projections. And by the way, like the, the brands that we had teamed up with, with for our application into LEC and using <coughs> that relationship, and we've gone out and spoken to massive sponsors, like not, not enough to go net positive, but like as good as you could possibly hope for, we worked out that we would actually like lose money on the sponsorship deals based on how this model worked. Because for example, if we are one of the biggest teams in L uh, LEC with our brand and we go out and we get a million dollar sponsorship, if one of the other teams only gets 200K, the distribution is even. So they're getting Riot part gets- your sponsorship. Yeah, yeah, Riot gets a huge part of our sponsorship deal and then they get uh, an, another part of our sponsorship deal. I'll give you an so, example, a reference point here, because the same thing happens in the Overwatch League. It's with the merchandising. So what happened is you share the profits. So I won't say the orgs, but one org did an amazing job. They branded themselves. They had a catchphrase. They had T-shirts. Guess what? The orgs that didn't sell any merchandise got an equal share of their profits. Yeah. You know what's great about this local? I always joke to you that the, the bizarre thing to me about American culture is you all brag all day long about your freedom and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And then every fucking business you try to make into a cartel, mm -hmm. which is just a, a mixture of crony capitalism and socialism, because this is why people don't want socialism. They don't want me to go out, make 100K, you to sit at home doing nothing, and I have to give you 50K in, in this ridiculous scenario I'm giving, obviously. <laughs> like, that's a problem. You get punished for succeeding. I'm this glad you didn't make a joke about this. <laughs> this, this, this is what like sparked all the sort of back and forths of like starting with uh, Ocelot saying like he wanted to get parasites out of the league or whatever mm -hmm. was he was privy to how this model was going to work sure. and he was like holy shit 
I'm G2 is already one of the biggest dogs. I want to make it bigger and better and whatever. And I'm going to have all these little parasites. G2esports.com shop. Exactly. Yeah, they're just, they're just going to be taking my revenue. They're like, this is bullshit. So we want to get them out of the league. The irony, of course, being that now they still have a bunch of parasites in the league and nothing really uh, came of it. And uh, But yeah, no. So the, the ridiculous thing with Riot side is so Riot take a huge proportion of the profits from team sponsorships. But the counterweight is meant to be, ah, yes, but we're Riot. So we're selling the league sponsors. These are going to be the big ones, like the really big ones. And you guys are going to get a massive portion of this divvied up amongst yourselves. The issue, of course, being that Riot has never been able to get big sponsorships for the league and continues to get very underwhelming sponsorships for the league. And don't, by the way, let the names fool you. Oh, we've teamed up with Nissan or whoever it is, Kia or some, whoever, whatever it is. The names are irrelevant. The names are literally irrelevant. In fact, I would feel like the bigger the name at this point in time, the less financial yes. commitment there probably is because they're probably just doing some kind of trial deal exactly. where it's like, okay, we'll put out all this high production <coughs> video. We'll give the illusion that we're in some kind of super deep, epic partnership. But the reality is, our checks are empty. We I can give you an example for this from my favorite company in esports, Refresh Entertainment. So when Astralis launched and was getting really big, they signed a deal, a partnership local with Audi, mm -hmm. the fucking yep. car company. And everyone in esports was like, holy shit, I bet they're getting Audis, I bet they're getting Mad No, no, it was literally like, basically like that. It was a, it was an initial, put your foot, toe in the water, test it out. By the way, if you're the esports org, the reason you never say that is you already benefit from idiots thinking you've got the big Audi deal, you know. And the difference is, fans to this day say, and Australis is sponsored by Audi. I'm like, you know, that hasn't even been on their website for like a fucking year or something. Like, they're not. And also, as he said here, this is a problem in esports. So you should know this from your native South Korea. If you go back in time, this is not an exaggeration, local, mm -hmm. to 2001, mm -hmm. when Boxer in StarCraft was the biggest name in Korea, right? Mm -hmm. he, won a t he won a tournament. It was the Coca-Cola OSL. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think Coca-Cola was giving fucking the money they give to the Olympic, you're out of your mind. Like, no, Coca-Cola was probably giving, I would guess, like six figures, maybe. Maybe they gave 100K because it was Korea. Mm -hmm. They definitely weren't giving, like, like when Puma does a deal with Cloud9, I'm going to go ahead and guess that's like fucking seven figures, mate. That's a big time deal. Well, more than that, eight, probably eight figures, I'd even assume. Mm -hmm. Like, th that's why he says the name can trick you as well. Mm -hmm. That's also, by the way, why another secret of esports, if you're a journalist, is do this, right? Every time there's a positive number, you can't fucking avoid it. They don't stop talking about it. Yeah. Anytime they won't tell you the numbers, think about why it would be. Think about why they won't tell you the viewership of a certain league. Think about why they won't tell you how much this new deal's worth. Think about why in the Overwatch League, they keep bragging about how when they have this thing called a home stand, where you have a home game and people come and play you there, they just brag about how many fans are there and how cool it looks. They never say what the gate is, how much money they make from it. But if they were making money local, any money, they would. Because if they could say this event made $10,000, that would actually be a reason for someone like he's saying who's an investor to go, hey, $10,000 is a lot now, but you're making money. This is a business. Mm -hmm. You know what's really sad is uh, when I used to play competitive Call of Duty, this is going back like 2007 or something. I remember we were attending a, a UK LAN event and we had like two sponsors. I say sponsors, they like one of them gave us gear. They didn't give us anything oh, cool. else. And then uh, one of the other ones paid for like half of our hotel bill or something. It's going to be like, something ridiculous event. like NVIDIA or something, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, well, yeah. So the um, the uh, peripheral company was SteelSeries. So we were sponsored by SteelSeries, sure. but it was only hardware support. And uh, I can't even remember what who was paying. Maybe for motherboard hotel. people or something. Yeah, yeah, I think it was like <coughs> Asus or something like that. And then we had uh, the third sponsor, well, not sponsor. It was like the, the guys who made our, our clothes, our shirts for the, for the event. And this was like, we weren't a part of like a big org or whatever. We were just a team of really good players who had like qualified for this tournament. We were going to go play this tournament. And one of the guys, so we were the points of contact with the, the sponsors. So sure. I, when we were getting the shirts made, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. The, this steel series demanded that yeah the logo be on the shoulder whatever yeah great and then they said do you want our logo on the shirt and i was like well, do we have to like i don't i don't remember signing it and like, no, no 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 but just do you want it and i was like well no and then one of my teammates was like no no, no let's put it on that's really cool then it looks yes. like we have three sponsors and i was like go. okay that guy was 17 years old by the way and you still have this like 
Uh, that man, nor Winston. <laughs> just, just a joke, just but, a but, yes. you, 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 say, you say that, but you go, go on, go on, splice this. I actually you. like nor as a person, by the way. I'll just say that now. I don't know why I'm saying that as well. I'm like having to give disclaimers. I'm a cunt. Who cares? Keep going. Uh, I, I don't. I'm going to say that right now. But right, uh, yeah. You. So, but yeah. I, uh, so, so yeah. We you go on Splice's website. You'll see like Turtle Wax, Foot Locker, whatever. And then you think, oh, look at Marty. He's a 40 year old man. There's no way that he would just think logos on a shirt would be cool. They must be getting paid loads of money. Yeah. Nah, turns out he just thinks logo on the shirt are pretty cool. And well, probably, you know, without me being quite so much of a dick, he probably thinks in his head, oh, if that people see that we're associated with these companies, then we'll get better deals with other companies. It gives us validation. Yeah, that's, like, I, that's, that's, yeah but that's, that's definitely true. Though. Wait, it, no. it's true to some degree. It, it, the thing is, mm-hmm. it, it does as a foot in the door but mm-hmm. once you actually break that anyone who wants to have a serious discussion about how the financials of a deal might work or whatever and who your potential conflicting mm-hmm. existing sponsors are that they're, ultimately they're going to find out that these are not financial deals mm-hmm. and then it becomes much more of an issue than what you'd hoped it would be mm-hmm. because it's like oh you guys have turtle wax let's talk about that oh it's not a financial deal this is weird why are you guys willing to give up a slot on your shirt and not take any money for it how valuable is this thing that we're actually discussing I, all of a sudden i don't really feel like i want to invest in you because you have these big sponsors who aren't sponsoring you and this is like a massive problem with uh in in, in like all of esports still like as you suggested with uh, cloud nine and some others um particularly because of their streaming prowess these guys have legitimately massive yeah, deals very very good deals. Their companies i remember tsm's logitech i couldn't believe tsm's logitech deal this was like two years ago or something it was a huge deal like six figures a month which mm-hmm. at the time for a peripheral sponsor was uh, unbelievable oh and rich let's just do the connect the dots so the timeline a couple of years ago logitech tsm biggest na org at the time a deal you remember what he said there six figures a month right and with six figures a month, why was TSM the one saying we lose money on League of Legends? That's how much fucking money these teams are going through. Yeah. Even if you win, even if you get the deal, it doesn't help you. The, the, the goal in esports right now, I've made, said it so many times, the joke in esports is this. You're not trying to be a profitable business. You're, you're trying, trying to be the so guy. Who, you're trying to be the guy who's not the slowest guy running away from a lion. Yeah. And that's why people but, are taking an investment to what if they <laughs> keep the lion away. Because like, but, uh, sure. It, People think I hate TSM, but I, I, and I kind of do. In, in, on some in my good level. Oh, yeah, 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 in, got in my own way. yeah. But Reginald, he is doing, as far as I'm concerned, I think probably in all of esports, he's done the best job with Doing's making job. his esports brand a business. And he his salaries have barely moved since yep. the inflation. He he's also his... killing it in terms of that, min-max. And yeah, Andy, Andy's shoot as fuck. And also, on top of that, Andy also... Like one of the reasons why TSM is so successful, Andy owns a lot of the websites. Yeah, I mean, he he he's he managed to keep. He got into franchising for him. It's probably worth it because what he pays his uh, players versus what other teams pay his play uh, pay their players for the clout that he already has. He'd already built his brand to a point where they can actually be mid-table mediocrity for a season or two, and the brand won't take a massive hit Mm -hmm. because he was one of the only people who actually managed to put the brand above the players that were on the brand. Mm -hmm. And so he is able to leave that... I don't want to say leave it dormant, that's a disservice, but they don't have to be the best team every year because he's got all these other streaming ventures and other business ventures on the side which are pulling in legitimate dollars, which the other teams aren't. And then you take... Uh, the opposite, or not the opposite, but someone like Steve, who has done an exceptional job in terms of like, if you gave him a tick box of you have to win all these tournaments and all these different games this year, he's gone out, he's done it. He has, I don't even know how he has the knowledge to put together one of the best PUBG teams. I can't even imagine he has time. He's killed it. I I always tell people as a general manager, he's the best in these sports. Yeah, like in terms of you want to hire a guy who's going to get you teams that win, the fact that the best team in the world is a North American team in, in Counter Strike is, is outrageous, is man. Unbelievable! It's yeah. completely unprecedented, and every single player on that team is North American. It's not like they've just you know exactly. imported all the best EU players. It's unbelievable. But exactly. at the same time, you know they're losing shitloads of money, and obviously there's a balance to be had. And if I was Steve, I mean, obviously I have no idea what the actual yes, internal workings yeah. are, but I. have I would think that it's right now is like the peak of his existence in Team Liquid because I do not believe that Team Liquid, on the trajectory that they're on, 
will become a profitable company. I think they have a good chance uh, when compared to their the teams around them purely because of the ludicrous level of success. So sure. if the non-endemics do just all decide to take the leap together, then they'll be at the top of the pile. But yes. that to me is a massive given, like not a, a not a given at all. And I side on uh, on the view of I don't believe it will happen. So for me, his stock's never been higher. And I would probably, I don't know, I'd probably go independent as a consultant or something or set myself up to do that because I believe he's probably diluted down to almost nothing uh, in terms of his stake in Team Liquid. I can't believe that they could have taken I'd imagine he just funding. gets an amazing salary. And that's yeah, yeah. Pro- probably. Approach, you know. But, uh, you know, and has side businesses he probably invests into, you know. If in the I ultimate... Mean, if, if- isn't the ultimate goal of all these works like in five years from now, in ten years from now, or if they start going to buy out each other, depending on like who's still around, like who has what players, like isn't the goal to serve like there aren't gonna be like two hundred, three hundred esports orgs in the future? Isn't all the goal to be like one of the ten, one of the twenty that's still standing around in five to ten years and that's where your valuation is crazy high? The the problem with even the, I mean, someone might look at it like that, but the mm-hmm. issue with that, that's like playing double or nothing at the casino right that only works if you have infinite money so if you're and like, you know you oh, succeed at the end mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly and which you which you can only guarantee if you have infinite isn't, money. isn't that what so, people are doing like acting like they have infinite money like they're losing money and they're consistently upping the salary sure. like salary of players bit... aren't going down it's going up and up like sure. it is there's, literally there's, like they have there's, infinite there's... money there's accountability though i mean this is what happened to noah it's like he went in spending you know what may as well have been infinite money and it's like guess what bro you have to either be successful or you have to you know in the performance or you have to start making money you did neither mm-hmm. yeah you can keep telling your investors don't worry don't worry it will come good it will come good but not everyone has infinite patience like mm-hmm. that mindset that you're going to be the last man standing you have to have infinite money and infinite patience mm-hmm. and there's still no guarantee at the end that you will be the last one standing so yes. I, I i don't think it's the great <laughs> mindset to have i still think you know it's it's obviously very hard because you have so many people who are willing to buy into horrendous business models that it does make it incredibly difficult to put together something competitive on a budget which isn't obscene it's yes. very difficult to do so it's a catch-22 of i'm going to put together a responsible business plan but i'm also uh not going to bank you know, so i'm not going to bank run my investors but how do i stay relevant i actually think league is one game where you could kind of do this and unicorns of love were kind of doing this where you just always have to accept that your best players will get taken at the end of the season and because there's such a high turnover higher than people think in terms of like new young talent coming in if you have a really fucking savvy person who's like keeping you know their ears to the ground on all the best talent you can kind of do it yes but you know <sighs> The irony there being, Rich, those teams don't exist anymore because of franchising. Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> They're the only teams that could have done it, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, What's, I don't know. What does the future... So, for me... This will have to be the last topic. Yeah. Right? Overwatch... <coughs> I think Overwatch is eventually gonna go away. Like, in terms of existing as a franchise, I don't think Call of Duty will survive. I think the big question is, like, for LCS and LEC, what's the future of that look like to you guys in five to ten years? Like, is, it a, is there a world it survives or... Is it a no-go? Oh, it will survive, but mm. it will just be investor carousel for the whole time. I mean, you've already seen it. I saw, you know, I, I'm just going to put this out there. I don't, I didn't really particularly, you know, want to want to put his feet to the fire. But since you bring it up, I saw that Jacob Wolf obviously works for ESPN. Mm. I like Jacob. Um, ESPN though does have ties with Disney, and I saw him put out this very strange thing talking about don't worry that all the L- LCS teams are selling their slots, guys, but I I think the fact that we're, what, a year and a half in mm-hmm. and so many teams are already looking to sell or have sold is just uh, foreshadowing what's going to carry on for, for, the, for the rest of time. The By only the way, way make- here's another read, a journalist read for you. This is the read for what that means. If it was laughable that it's failing and everyone's an idiot, it would be lol. What's all these kids saying that everyone should sell their teams? It's fucking stupid. It would be, it would be lighthearted. If you say like, don't worry, nothing's wrong. This room is not on fire whatsoever. I'm just wearing a shirt that has an optical illusion. Like that's that's like what that tweet sounds like. You should you should if you <clears throat> own an LCS team, you should absolutely sell it. If you bought in for ten million, and by the way, you pay an instalment. So however you structure like 
the oh the real joke going. there is the like i you know what i, I won't make a joke about this because people will get too butt hurt but put it this way you could make an argument that the best thing that fucking happened to echo fox was that guy saying all that racist shit in that email yeah for sure they're gonna they were they, forced to cash out before they lost everything yeah, they're, 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 they bought in for 10 million dollars which would be paid out over <laughs> four years and instead they got bought out for 32 million or, or whatever it is that's ridiculous you would never get that money back you would just you'd be you'd be more likely to lose 30 million over the next five years than you would to get it back so if you can make three times your money from selling the slot you should absolutely do it the reason why people aren't doing it is because the people who started you know it was very difficult for me to have conversations with with uh my investors when i really wanted to be involved but deep down i knew it was completely screwed that was really difficult to like rein myself in for just constantly trying to peddle this idea that I really want to be in LCS. I have to be in LCS. And what's happening is I started H2K, right? And loads of people who are still in the league, they were there at the inception of their organization, or at least in terms of as it relates to League of Legends or whatever. And they're so emotionally invested in the game itself, the idea of like competing at the highest level of something that they find it so hard to let go and it skews their judgment and excuse the advice that they give to the people who don't actually have any knowledge of the game so they're kind of relying on you to relay accurate information about the the, the projected economics and that's the reason why these people stay in they continue to get diluted they continue to get more diluted and they're like as long as i'm involved i'm okay with it and to a certain extent this is what happened to rick fox and i have empathy for rick fox like when i was and it's watching... also a passion project you know they just yeah, want to be no, winners and stuff yeah that's exact. That's exactly it. And and at some point in your mind, that becomes a greater priority than the money. And here's that's the joke fine I've got. Like, I've got. A, I've got a good premise for you. You'll like this one. Since you know European soccer and the Premier League, right? The joke is what made the Premier League the best league in the world and an awesome sports league is all these billionaire businessmen were like, I'm just going to buy a team as my play thing. Who gives a fuck about making yeah. money? Get all the best players. And then I want to be able to say, look, I took a team that was just some East London team. And now it's like the world champion, right? We, in esports, we skipped the part where you're nobody. We skipped the whole profit making part. We skipped straight to the part where it's the play thing, except people don't know that it's a play thing. And at least they had the money before to justify eventually then losing it all. Like We never did the part that was the good part. And the problem is as well is you have everyone who was like the original owner or instigator and then ultimately becomes like part of the management team or like member on the board or whatever, but they don't own the majority of the shareholding or whatever. They all came up with the the inception of esports itself. Yes. So like I grew up with esports or whatever. That does I do not have anything special like about me from a business perspective or background. I didn't go to business school, anything like that. I just really liked video games and esports. And then acknowledge. And because I, I made a few good decisions, which didn't actually particularly rate, relate to business itself. Yeah. It was more like, oh, okay, this could work, this could work. And then suddenly I'm in a position where I'm at the table with billionaires and I'm pitch, I'm doing a business pitch. There are so many people who are, have a similar story who are now making horrendous decisions. And that's the problem. And that's the reason why esports is in a really sorry state right now financially it's because you have all these people who care more they've never had any money themselves they were not massive billionaires most of them are like you just car salesmen i always say yeah and they 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 care more about being involved than they do about managing other people's money and that's sure. that's you know it's a usual uh, the premier league analogy to a certain extent that's what hap what's happened in lpl when you have these uh family-owned businesses where i'm sure some of it's just straight up money laundering but i'm sure for other people it's also you know uh i'm massively rich i'm going to give my son a plaything, and yes. he's going to call he, he's going to call it edward gaming for some reason and that's that's how it plays out but yeah here that they are at least conscious of the fact that they do not expect to get any money back that mm -hmm. is literally his child's play thing sure but right. The, uh, the yeah. thing is, we've got to we've got to pull this to a close. At some oh, wait, I'll uh, make one last. No, we'll make one last point okay. each. Local. So the point I would make is this. Again, here's a good example of something in the industry that you might not have noticed, but if you think about the correlation, it's very telling of where esports is at. So, who are the people that, in theory, should know the industry of esports the most? 
It's the people who were businessmen who succeeded repeatedly as esports came up, right? Like Rich was saying there. But at the time, obviously, because it wasn't a big business, mm -hmm. anyone who was really good at business, it's like, the, here's the reason, Local, why I'm the last esports journalist from like 2001, mate. It's because those people probably better than me. These people had journalism degrees. You think they stuck around making $200 a fucking month? No, they just went and became a real journalist. Mm -hmm. They just went and did a real job and applied their skills in exchange for goods and services in the real world, not sitting in a fucking bed sit like I was basically doing. So what I would say is this. <clears throat> I've got a classic example for you, right? You might not know him personally. I don't know. Do you know Audi from Dignitas? Yeah, he's yeah. in my stream all the time. Right. The reason I'm going to use him as an example yeah. is because a guy I know, it's a guy I actually like. Right, Audi is someone who's really old school. He was back when I was beginning in esports. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Audi, I'll tell you, is he comes from a council estate. He fucking loves money. Mm -hmm. He loves money. And to, so all you need to know is this. Look at when Audi sold Dignitas. It was way before now, look, there was no 200 million valuations. Mm -hmm. He sold them for a few million because that means, here's the read, his read was, I've been in this industry the whole time. This is the peak. This is when I cash out and get my millions. Because you know what? Over the lifespan of Dignitas, obviously, I haven't put millions of dollars mm. in. You know, I put a lot in, but it wasn't millions. So now's my time to cash out for what I, and not waste my career. Now, here's the interesting detail, Loco. Did you know Audi just bought into Rogue? Yeah. Yeah, he didn't buy the whole team. He doesn't own Rogue. He just bought in as an investment. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know. He's willing to gamble a little bit of his money and maybe give a little bit of his expertise to guide it. He didn't want to own a whole fucking team, though, and potentially lose it all. That's my point. Anyway, do you want to make a last point? Well, my point is, I mean, it's LCS and esports is in a bubble because, as we talked about, like, the viewership can't reach the numbers like the salaries are at least as far out. as i know you know yeah. unless something like crazy happens like mm -hmm. a, the, in, uh, but the problem is it's the equivalent of like inventing a warp drive mm -hmm. like you know, it's not like they have to just go from six to seven they have to go from six to 99 mm -hmm. <laughs> so my understanding is until teams are selling less for the amount they bought in like in a sense like the bubble's still growing no yeah, co consumer confidence. Because mm -hmm. by the way, there's the other joke. You might like this one, Rich. The way I always wreck the Overwatch League is by just being accurate. I say, guys, you don't understand. The customer of the Overwatch League is whoever bought a fucking franchise. Whoever bought a $20 million slot, he's the customer Blizzard's catering to. And they're the one that they have to make happy and that they have to keep in the game. Mm -hmm. So along similar lines, yeah, exactly that loco. Like in that scenario, as long as consumer confidence is great, then you know what? Some of these people will make loads of money. Someone will sell... I'll give an example. Someone might sell Cloud9 for 200 million. Mm -hmm. The point is, eventually someone's going to make some actual money along the way. It can't just all be like confidence and then I just get some of your money and I transfer it from here to here. And like, mm -hmm. it has to be real eventually. So don't be worried until spots are selling for less than 10 mil. When, when I don't know about that, mate. Mm -hmm. I'll also say, by the way, just because it's worth saying the disclaimer at the end, like some of these are examples we've used. Also, it's just our take on the industry. Like, you know, there might be slight details to the deals we don't know or things that were different. And there's obviously, it's not like it's the end of the world. To be fair, a lot of businesses run in fucking bad state in the modern world. Like, just look at the media industry, mate, my field. Like, they're hemorrhaging money out their ass. That's why what they do is the business model, at like a prestigious paper, like the New York Times, is publishing a, an opinion piece, literally racially offending all of their viewers in the hopes that their viewers angrily click the piece and give them a load of hits and pay a fucking freelancer two hundred dollars for doing it. Like that's the state of the world we live in at the moment. So this is late stage capitalism. Not necessarily a massive fan of that either. So to be fair, Loco, like I don't know if anyone can succeed. I'd just say have a good life. Try not to get wrecked by me too much. And see you on the next episode. Oh my god, there's the next episode of. Actually, we've got more to go on this episode. To be fair, right, yeah. are you, any final words, Rich? No, I, I would just kind of, uh, in closing, say that um, the from a from a team's perspective, like holistically as an industry, like the money that's being right, made right now in the space is primarily through things like streaming, and in terms of like obviously the the IP holders like Activision, Blizzard, and Riot, these guys are making a shit ton of money. Um, whenever I'm you're making having... quite a lot. Well, sure. Uh, independent. Don't have any costs for that. Why, why, why do you have to put that in there? Because I'm killing it. What can I tell you? My industry, the Thorin industry is going great. So if anyone wants to buy into that for 200 mil, got slots available. Or if you believe that Thorin should reallocate some of his resources to a more worthy esports course, then uh, he's put there himself go. there. And uh, yeah, it's, and but whenever you're like having any kind of discussion about what team should do Y and X, like just have the concept uh, yes. in mind that 
none of these teams are making any money and everything they do is probably putting them further in the red. So thinking that you know, <coughs> this off season, uh, you know, it turns out that Misfits actually sold all their contracts for like $2 million. That doesn't mean that they can now, they literally have that money and can now go oh, and do things. By the them. way, that reminds me one point we didn't make. I sort of alluded to it before, but just, mm. just think of everything we've just said in this conversation. Think of the timeline we set for the league teams. Now imagine where the fuck Mark Merrill's box was at when he started telling TSM to stop taking all their profits from league and putting it in other games. This motherfucker was living on Mars telling me what the weather's like on Jupiter. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. This guy is, he's like one of those rich people who couldn't tell you what the price of a fucking pint of milk is. He's like, I don't know, uh, $300? Oh, uh, oh, sorry, is that too high? I mean, three cents? Oh, fuck, what am I doing? It's like, but this guy doesn't even know what the fuck... All he knows how to do is chop a few fucking Benjamins off and have some kid boost him into fucking Plat 4 or something. That's about all he can do. And then tell people, like, uh, here's my opinion on Faker stream. Like, shut the fuck up, mate. Trindamir is a shit cat. Actually, that's not even him. He's fucking rising here. Have I got that wrong? Is he Trindamir? Trindamir yeah, is a shit cat he champion is. anyway. Now, i tell you what, mate. Unlike the real Trindamir, you don't have an invulnerability ult that'll fucking help you survive this business. So, see you in 10 years. Hey, AOC, uh, end, AOC once paid uh, $7 for a cross on, you know? So, we should probably just completely redo capitalism. Right, yeah. So. Let's, just, let's just redo it all. all it's right. got to end. All right, cool. All right, anyway, thanks, Rich. All right. Yeah, no problem. See you guys later. Cheers, Bye. mate. Oh, man. Oh man, every day I stray further away from Riot. Every day, every day. Oh, you drop off that one, mate. Yeah. You know. Oh my I'm god. Up, mate. <laughs> Here's the thing, though, local. This is why you, you have, this is why you have to make this choice. Because let's face it, right? If yeah. you just think of Loco Doco the podcaster, yeah. that was an amazing episode. Yeah. I, the amount of jewels he dropped there was unreal, mate. I mean, I told I, you it was going to be a good one. It it was a good one, but uh, there's like two two sides I'm always fighting with. Like there is like. I would love to be on Riot Desk. Like I would love to do Riot Analyst work. Like I would. I, I mean, I would love to be on LCS Desk. And I also, I also think I'd be great at it. And I have good chemistry with Mark. I have good chemistry with Crumbs and Dash. And I also know like Riot doesn't like you very much. Riot doesn't like me very much. And I'm pretty sure like me doing episodes like that, like <laughs> I'm pretty. Riot also doesn't like Monty. Riot doesn't like my friends. And yeah, yeah it is what it is. Well, let's well, do it. Maybe maybe one of the two parties will get the hint at some point in time and stop actually like pursuing the other one. Maybe, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm a stupid boy. Anyways, let's start with us. Right. Yes. We all have dreams. We all have naive dreams, mate. It's mm. all right. Um, let me think. Right, I think here's what we'll do. Like, I haven't got loads of time. I could probably give like half an hour, 40 minutes. I'll tell the person I'd do something with after this. I like, okay. delay it 20 minutes. Right. But here's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about the most interesting teams. And all let's right. just go into that. Let's... So let's start with the obvious one, right? T. The team you said would win the split. <laughs> team Liquid? They're doing great. No, you said Team Solo mid would win the split. Now listen, oh. it's all bad news, guys. They beat Echo Fox, who at the moment are about to get the fuck out of the league because they be dropping their member N bombs. So that's who that's who Team TSM can be. They can beat a company that refuses to oust racists. So there's one. There's a positive for you. Not bad. Hey, we start looking up. Now about the person you rated. Number one mid lane in the league. I believe there's another show. I don't watch it, Pussy. I only watch my own shows and my own content. I don't give a fuck about it now. Oh, sometimes I watch LEC. But I I know local does this show called Face Check. And I'll tell you what, appropriate name. Because the way that these guys do analysis is they just run with their face, like double lift at season one worlds in a fucking brush and hope there isn't a fucking Alistair or something in there. I think it was, he was Alistair, actually, I think, in that one. Anyway, so in their, mid, in their rankings of top mid laner, I believe it was even last week, no, no, no. These last, more fuckers. Two weeks ago, two, two weeks, weeks ago. ago. Two yeah. weeks ago. Two weeks ago, they all had Bjergsen number one mid laner in the league. I'm not talking, listen, I'm not talking about beginning of the split. I would have had him number one. They had him two weeks ago number one. So, so let's okay. give us your thoughts then. What's happening with TSM? Right. It's obviously not a good look, is it? First of all, for the face check um, tier list, I will protect one person, Zyrene. Zyrene actually had Niski, Jensen, Bjerg for his top three. So he didn't, okay. put, he didn't put Bjerg number one. And then also... Smart boy. You can see why he's not a right anymore. <laughs> My opinion on TSM right now, and also Bjergsen, I think Bjergsen had his worst week regionally ever. I don't think Bjerg has ever played worse than last weekend. Like, both TF games were fucking atrocious. And one thing that really made me think about last week a lot and how Bjergsen played was kind of the choice of champion. So they were in a draft situation where they were versus 100 Thieves, and they picked Corky. 
and they already had Gragas on their team. So it's something that everyone knows, like Gragas plus Yasuo is the strongest mid 2v2. And that's something they could have actively opted into and that's something they even hovered and they talked about. And instead of going for the strong mid 2v2, instead of telling the team, hey, give me the ball, I'm fucking Bjergsen, I'm gonna make the shot, I'll carry you guys, he opted into TF. I have no idea if that was Tony we're gonna, telling him we're gonna okay. pick TF here, or if that was Bjerg saying, I don't wanna play TF, or I don't wanna play Yasuo, I'm gonna pick TF. But I, I was like, my mind was just fucking blown. Like the fact that they wouldn't opt into Gragas Yasuo and that they don't wanna play the strong 2v2 versus 100 Thieves. Like, Can 100... I ask you a question? Sure. Right? Wouldn't the logic there be, and it's not a terrible logic, mm -hmm. is remember, one of the things I have a criticism of Bjergsen for, by the way, isn't his skill level. I actually believe if he had the right mentality and the right coaching staff, he would hard carry the fuck out of games like Froggen does when he goes well in Golden Guardians because mm -hmm. he has the whole team set up around him. One of the complaints I have about Bjergsen as a player is that I think he sacrifices too much for the rest of his team. So in this scenario, I would guess his logic was, mm -hmm. well, our macro is absolute ass cheeks right now. Mm -hmm. So at least if I'm TF, I can just be all over the map, can't I? I'll give up having the winning lane perhaps mm -hmm. to just go and just go and help everyone else on the map. I can't believe I'm saying your own argument, but it is like when you have... I'm not even you, no, I'm trying to make ideas from you. Know, the yeah. thing is, when you have shitty players around you, you need to ask for the ball and you need to be the superstar yes. carry. And that's the rule that Bjergsen needs to fulfill right now. Like as a leader and as the best player on that team, he needs to be the carry and he needs to take onus on himself. Like it's, some, like, it's a random Twitch comment, but it actually like kind of ringed and there was like a tiny bit of truth in it. And that was like, local. you're such a TSM shill. You know, in Spring Split, the only reason TSM was good was because Bjergsen got to play OP champions like Akali, Irelia, and he carried the team. Of course, Acadian was much Maybe better. Maybe an exaggeration, yeah. but there's some truth yeah. to it, right? Acadian was much better. Broken Blade was much better in Spring. So it's Zben and Smoothie. But there is some truth to that. Like TSM's success in Spring came off of Bjergsen playing these like insane OP champion and having a huge effect on the game. And the fact that they're going away from that in their time of need is like crazy to me. Here's the thing though. Like, first of all, I think that she twisted fate, perfect character for Bjergsen. Because here's the thing, Bjergsen, let me examine your twisted fate and pull your motherfucking card. And guess what? It ain't a gold one, but all I'm gonna tell you, son, is ultimately that's the last time you'll ever be fucking global at the state TSMs and right now straight fire. Everything should they're fucking straight fire. <laughs> <laughs> you could have ended fucking good. I had to big myself up. I had to get I act like it was my own boys fucking holding me back. But anyway, right? You could have added an Andy blue card one. That would have been perfect. That was the last exactly. bit that I was missing. Here's the real uh, analysis of TSM is I sort of get it, local. Even though mm. I always tell people my weakest area of understanding in league is individual matchups and mm. meta matchups because I basically have to just follow what the rest of the people say mm. and try and figure out which I think is the correct answer, right? Mm. But I will say this. In a world in which every fucking mid lane is like Corky versus Azir, mm -hmm. mate, I don't actually know which side of that I would even want Bjergsen on in this current TSM. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you want to be Azir as Bjergsen in a team that's like a bunch of the other lanes are failing, you have an issues with coordinating with your jungle, your macro isn't good, it's going to be hard to find a way to win the game. I know what you mean. Like, mm -hmm. I, 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 if you could get to an Akali or something... I, I could see that being like a, a sort of band-aid that could maybe work. Like I, I agree with you on that principle, but I also think if I look at what I think the coaching staff's doing, there's almost a logic to it. It's just oh. unfortunately, you're not, you're not going to want to hear this. You're going to love the this. Logic, the logic is basically kind of like what you've seen with Fnatic, where you are admitting that you've got to use a band-aid. You're saying like, listen, I'm bleeding at the moment. I've got a fucking wound. All I can do is patch myself up and I can't heal till the off season. So for now, I'm just going to lose loads of games or I can try some shit that seems weird and maybe grab a few wins. And at least obviously, here's the positive for TSM. They're still in the playoff picture, obviously. Like they're still got a very good chance of making two playoffs. So right now, I think they're just, they're just trying to stay afloat and get to playoffs. And then you hope for the miracle run. Speaking of coaching staff, you're going to fucking love this. <laughs> Guess who's back? Oh, I saw my favorite character ever from a, from an esports reality TV show. I told you he's like Kramer because the main show of Seinfeld isn't about Kramer. It's yeah. about like Jerry and then George is his friend and then Elaine. Some, but then every time you're watching it, you can't wait for that moment, can you? When Reggie, aka Kramer, hits that door, slides in. Oh, you're gonna want to chop, Bjergsen. You're not doing it right with the fucking. What's going on with the boots? Hey, listen. When I was in season two, I used to tell the odd one, "Come to my mid lane all the time. I flash level two. We get the kill. Game over, bro. Game over. Bay life." It's like, he's like fucking Kramer, he's like, except less racist, obviously. <laughs> anyway. I think 
you can criticize Andy's game knowledge nowadays. I don't think Andy has... I'm joking about yeah. that, but no, no, I no. actually do think he has good game knowledge. No, well, no, I actually... I, I respect the fuck out of Andy's like base game knowledge, but the league like League of Legends has changed so much, and also yeah, of course. just general coaching and knowledge around the game has gotten so much better. Where I would actually think like as a coach in terms of knowledge, Andy wouldn't be the best. But one thing Andy does provide is direction, and that's one thing this team needs. But the caveat is, what about Tony? When you have an owner come in, like one way or the other, the future isn't looking good. So I'm. I still fully support and believe in Tony as a coach, but I don't know like what the future of TSM looks like. Like in 2020, like wh- where where does this go? Like if they do well with Andy coming in, like that's a bad sign. If they do shitty with Andy coming in, that's a bad sign. So yeah, like everything is just up in the air. You there? Holy shit! Right, the rip. <laughs> Riot people got him. Riot people with TSM. Dorian made too much enemies. Wait, wait, wait. Hmm? I'm waiting. Right, there we go. It did the Discord bug again where I was actually, I could hear you, so I thought you were, but then I noticed you just never replied, so mm. I could tell I was bugged. Anyway, I heard what you said, though. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Here's the thing that I need to say, Loco. Nobody's thought of this, because this, this is one of the reasons, by the way, why, I'm not joking. This will sound like a mad, egotistic comment. Actually, if I, I actually think I have the best superpower in the world. What's it's just superpower? having a good memory. Oh. Having a good memory. Because when you have a good memory, a better memory than the person you're talking to, mm-hmm. you can always find where they made a mistake, where they forgot something, where they didn't mention it, and so you'll always have an edge. Mm-hmm. So one of the areas that no one else has brought this point up is, do you remember before Zix joined TSM? Mm-hmm. Do you remember what he famously said in a leaked Skype conversation? Um, what is I it? think he literally said something like, it's cancer to work for TSM or something mental. Yeah. And this is exactly why. Because his point was, you have all the pressure of the fans, you're expected to win, and the implication was, like, Reggie's going to be right up your fucking ass. he's going to be breathe, breathing down your neck all the time, like, the pressure's going to be insane. That's why I feel bad for the guy, because I thought, I agree with you, I thought Zix did a very good job in spring. Because that's the thing, this is where people never get me. If you only, if I, because the problem is, right, when I'm a host, mm. I generally let the guest choose where the topic goes because that way they can talk about it, right? And mm. I just think I can talk about anything. Mm-hmm. So as a result, I will always look like I'm defending a losing position because I let them go where they're strong. Mm-hmm. If I want to go where I'm strong, I can just pull it right back over. So anyone who thinks that I thought TSM was a garbage team in spring, no. I think that their actual roster was nowhere near the best. And I think to almost win the LCS off, that is fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. I actually think Zix did an awesome job that split. I had no mm-hmm problem whatsoever him being the coach was he actually the coach of the split um, he was right Am I wrong first, on that? first spring he had to be who else would it be it would have been him or reaper what? wasn't it reaper was it i think it was Tony. was it reaper that's was... the one thing i didn't remember there okay it might have been reaper okay chat saying reaper they have better memory okay anyway i would have said if they'd have picked well it's because for that one mate I, I don't ever watch the actual segments on fucking lcs half the time so i don't i only ever see it when it's on gamepedia so i will say this I thought he did a bang up job in spring. Mm-hmm. I actually even think in the context of some of the things we discussed here, I actually don't think he's done a terrible job in summer. Like I think a lot of the failures sadly are player based. I think some of the players just end up being a bit overrated. Some of them have, have had massive individual problems. I don't think you can put that all on Zix. And I even think they've got more wins in the league right now than they should. Like one of the things I'm impressed with in a fucked up way is TSM's won so many games this split that like, for me, they shouldn't have won. I mean, the GGS one's an obvious example. Like <laughs> GGS basically were just like, it's like GGS like through an alley-oop as they were about to dunk it themselves, they alley-ooped it to their own basket and then TSM just slammed it in at the last second. Like, like that game was just one where it's like, that's not in TSM's power to win the game. You uh, that, need a, a favor from from the idiots on GGS, you know? Yeah, so exactly. When, when you get some of those wins, yeah. that's like that still counts, mate. There's, there's still a win on the board. That doesn't count good of your team, though. That just counts know, it like but it's GGS being board. garbage. That's just GGS being bad. I don't know. <laughs> Here's the question, though, Loco. Yeah? Surely you're not going to do this. Surely I'm not the one who has to give you a fucking pep talk about TSM. You're not just going to, like, offload them and sell the stock, are you? Like, you surely still no, believe. I, I still believe, but... Oh, man. I think... Here's the thing. If I don't... There's, like, 10... There's, like, 1,024 situations regarding how it can play out. And then there's only 12 situations where TSM makes play... Or TSM doesn't make playoffs. So I think TSM not making playoffs is, like, a fucking bullshit narrative. But I think one thing is, though, like, all this, like, TSM rogue talk, like, Andy coming in, and then, like, now this talk about TSM not making playoff, there's so much pressure on TSM players, and so much pressure on TSM overall as an org, so, and 
just the narrative aren't isn't that great for TSM, and I'm not sure how they're gonna do under the pressure like going into playoffs. So, yeah, it, I've it, got it, an it, angle for you there, mm-hmm. and this is actually a sad one, unfortunately. Normally, listen, you can you can attest to this yourself, local. Mm-hmm. You had you had times in TSM where on paper in the regular split you weren't necessarily the best team, mm-hmm. but you won in the playoffs, right? It yeah. helps to have experienced players and a good core and to have the best player in the league's pretty good as well. Like these yeah. are all factors that can help you win, even if on paper you shouldn't win. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll go ahead and say this. The problem TSM has right now is if you look at the current standings, they can't benefit from those qualities because the only team they could get in the playoffs, like when they go deep, Mm -hmm. that is vaguely inexperienced is CLG. And CLG's best strength right now is having a fucking monster jungler. That's the one thing you don't want to play for your TSM right now. Like Mm -hmm. you don't mind, obviously if you could play GGS, if you had a better seed, you'd love that. I think you don't want to play, you don't want to play CLG. Like they, a lot would have to go wrong, I think for them to lose it. that I'll disagree with you on. I think it's ingenious to say they have a monster jungler. They have a new jungler that's looked great in summer. I know it's so funny because we're switching roles. Like, cause I'm the one like that's. I was. Does anyone remember the broken blade thing? Yeah. Last split. I'm the Who one making like the fucking guy of Germany or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that that was preaching Wiggly, but Wiggly has zero playoff experience. Like to speak sure. of him as a monster jungler going into playoffs, I will say CLG being CLG locking in second feed. And TSM matching up versus CLG is their one shot at getting to finals. That is literally their one shot. This CLG team has very little experience in playoffs. This CLG roster is hot for summer. This is one team where it's a little bit frazzle. I think if they played C9 or TL in playoffs... By the way, just so people don't flame you, which by the way, you never notice, I always do this. Uh-huh. I always correct where someone would make it, would flame my co-host. Mm-hmm. So here's one area, right? When Loco says they don't have playoff experience, he doesn't mean like Power of Evil, Biofront. He just mm-hmm. means collectively as a core. That's mm-hmm. the point is as a team, they don't because they didn't make spring playoffs. Mm-hmm. So I think versus C9 or TL, it's, it's so fucking hard for TSM to pull out a win in a best of five. But CLG, they have a shot. So, yeah, that's one. They do. Like, here's the thing, though. Loco, like, you have to realize, I didn't say more than he's a monster jungler. I mean, right now, he's a monster jungler. Like, mm-hmm. on paper, right now, I'll, get, I'll give you the example. It obviously does happen. Like, mate, I'll go ahead and tell you right now. Mm-hmm. I don't call myself, like, an NFL expert, but I've watched quite a lot of games. Mm-hmm. Mate, I thought, like, on paper, not going by what happens in the playoffs, on paper, I think the LA Rams should have shit all over the Patriots. Yeah. I thought that was gonna I thought that was gonna be a massive blowout. Cause I thought they have like some sick individual defenders who will lock Brady down. And then I thought, look at their fucking offense. They're gonna just run all over this motherfucker. And obviously in the playoffs, this is the analogy, they had no offense, right, when they mm-hmm. got to the finals. Like they actually struggled to be even one touchdown. Whereas this is a team that I think used to average like 30 points a game or something. Mm-hmm. And they got like something ludicrous in the final, like single digits so yeah i agree that could certainly happen it's just that i think to be fair when you set it up i i know what you mean like i've actually won a lot of bets in esports by betting against inexperienced players and then them, them failing in the big game but the problem is there is a world in which it, they obviously don't fail and they uh, yeah, just turn out to be amazing and then they're the next good team right that can happen as well but it's clg I know it's different, but it's still CLG. It is. It would what be- are you talking about? They've got Weldon Green. He's literally going to be inside their fucking minds. You have to understand, they've already played this game 700 times. Dude, oh man. Speaking of Weldon, Weldon looks so good right now. Because this was like the one sure. diss at Weldon. You succeeded with TSN. You succeeded with G2. Yes. You succeeded yes. when you had all the pieces like what happens when you don't have the pieces like look at you look at you with clg you guys aren't even making playoffs like look at you and then now he took this roster and he's about to clinch a top two seed like you have to give him credit yes i do certainly Mm -hmm. and i also told you i even think for this squad he makes the most sense in terms of his skill set as a head coach like Mm -hmm. i actually think as a head coach he's probably doing more than some other head coaches in lcs who are just the head coach who take what the analyst says and tell the players who say, and by the way, don't be out past 10 p.m. Like, that's a shit job. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. Weldon, even in his vlogs, actually does acknowledge that that guy... Oh, fuck what's his name? what's the name of the guy who's like yeah irene he yeah. basically says that like he sings that guy's praises a lot like he even said that oh, that guy he in so he said in solo queue that guy's above like clg players really holy shit yeah that's like kane Apparently he's like a legit player yeah, yeah. kane and, not legit as fuck. a lot of times kane will be higher than a few of the tl players and i, I guess irene also tell you what he'll never be higher than meteos also i don't know if he plays solo queue does he <laughs> oh my god 
I actually like me, yes, whatever. You know what that joke is, homie. And plus, also, you know, respect, yeah. respect. I, I see that game. I see that crop you'd be harvesting. <laughs> and I'm not talking about a crop of young talent like CLG's okay. got a wiggly. Let's Ooh. talk about hey. your favorite player and maybe not your favorite team, Golden Guardians. Sure. What do you think about them this week? Froggen playing Karthus, Froggen a little bit back to the roof with Karthus, Velkaz. The thing you have to say about mm -hmm. Froggen is, and in this sense, I always draw the contrast to Power of Evil. Mm -hmm. Even though, in general, I would agree, if you're just an average run-of-the-lane mid laner, mm -hmm. if you can't play the, or you don't play the, the OP picks, mm -hmm. I will probably think, probably something wrong with you. When players like them click the champions that no one else plays, mm -hmm. it's because they know how to play that champion in a way no one else can. It's mm -hmm. actually a strength in a weird way. Because as you've seen this split, Froggen's played TF, Froggen's played Ka Talon. These mm -hmm. didn't look terrible. They weren't amazing games. Like the Talon one was pretty average. I mean, he never could do anything in that game, to be fair. But it wasn't like Cap's Talon, obviously. He was nowhere near that. But I'll tell you what, that, that's where you can't talk about... Le le this is a problem we have in this game, mm -hmm. is all the really aggressive pop-off players... Also, people make the mistake of assuming that makes them better players. Mm -hmm. So an area where I think this is key to me is, dude, just go and watch Froggen, because this split, he's done it when he plays Anivia, mm -hmm. when he plays Velkoz, when he plays Karthus. Why don't they just gank him all day long, Loco? It's fucking NA. You can just gank mid all day with a mid mm -hmm. spot. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The guy is unreal at positioning in that sense. Like, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And here's the key thing you need to notice. Opposing coaches don't even draft to do that. They don't even draft the super aggro jungler to do it because they know, why bother? Why not just go gank the other lanes, mm -hmm. leave this guy to farm, get like two kills. At the end of the game, Thorin can go, ah, fucking Froggen has to carry every bloody game and then you still win the game. Sounds like, it's like the joke is, that's how, I don't know if you know this, that's how in the NBA coaches actually coach. Mm -hmm. If there's a star player like Kobe Bryant, mm -hmm. fucking Steph Curry, James, if they go off for 50, the logic goes like this. We well, don't go off for 99 and my average in the game is 100. So let him have 50, mm -hmm. shut everyone else down. He gets 50. The fans get to see a great game. We get the win. Everyone's happy. <laughs> well, Except Golden Guardians fans. <laughs> um, so here, here's my criticism towards Froggen. Um, I don't know exactly how their team operates, but it's like a commonality with Froggen teams. A lot of times, like, Froggen teams don't know how to win, and their mid and late game shot calling is bad. It's not saying Froggen's mid and late game shot calling is sure. bad, but if consistently, if the teams you've been on don't know how to close out games, and you are, like, the primary carry, and oh, you local. are the I would even player. acknowledge, by the way, mm -hmm. here's, a, here's an example I'll give you of how fair I can be. Just as I criticize Bjergsen's shot calling, and I don't think he should be the main shot caller. I think he should have a voice because he's the mid laner, but I don't think he should be the main shot caller. Mm -hmm. I th I've always said the same thing about Froggen. I actually think that's another flaw of Froggen. Mm -hmm. is because he, he has that mentality that I hate in players where they believe that just because you're getting older than your teammates, you should be the leader in the game as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think so. I think there are people in the game who are just brilliant at that. And you should kind of like take a role, but have them do that aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if it was my dream, there would be some six. Like, I, dude, tell you a player I would take tomorrow. I'd love Smoothie on Golden Guardians. Let this guy shot call the fuck out of everything. Mm -hmm. I'd love that. Because mm -hmm. Golden Guardians and Frog, I think Golden Guardians is such a frogging team. They're amazing at certain things, but they're so fucking bad at certain things, and it hinders them so much. I think they only know one way to win the game, and it's through late game team fighting, it's through getting these champions that Frog and Love playing, scaling up, and then getting that late game <coughs> fighting going. Like, they don't know how to scale off of early game. They don't know how to snowball off a of bot lane. Like, they just don't, they can't win through split push. Like, they had that game where Froggen was on TF, Hunter was on, I forgot which split pusher, either Camille or Aatrox, and they had a lead and they couldn't do it. And they just kept going for 50-50 Barons. Like, the only way this team can really function is through team fighting and existing in that, like, manner. Uh, let me think. Which game are you referring to there? Was that, are you, I think you were referring to the TSM game, actually, from last week. Was oh, it? Oh, two weeks ago. It's where they 50 50 where Baron played. over and over again. He played TF. Well, he played TF and Hansa was on uh, Aatrox. Okay, yeah, yeah. Is this the right game? Yeah, I think it's the right game. Right. I agree, but here's the problem. And this is sound like a fucked up thing to say. And this is how you know I'm not actually just like a fan of teams. Mm -hmm. To me, it's still the same as Spring Mate. Golden Guardians doesn't show you how good Golden Guardians is. It shows you how fucking bad the rest of the LCS is. Because, dude, look at the teams they just beat. Optic Gaming. Optic's a team on the rise. 100 Thieves are supposed to have great macro. They beat these teams. Mm -hmm. They've also, as I said, come close to beating the TSMs, the Cloud Nines of the world. Like, this isn't a joke. Like, what's bizarre to me is, as much as, like, I agree, like, Team Liquid's a level above the rest, 
But I'm sometimes shocked by like how bad the middle of the pack can be in that respect. Because here's the difference. Golden Guardians on paper doesn't have a very good roster. Mm -hmm. Some of those other teams, like I know Optic and Only Thieves aren't the best example for that one, but mm -hmm. some of the other teams do have a good roster. Like they should never lose to a team like Golden Guardians, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Dude, all right. Let's, it is best to one or to be fair. Let's go to some shitter teams. Let's go to Echo Fox. So when it comes to Echo Fox, I mean, there's- I've got a question for you. Okay. We've got to do it. We've got to have the discussion we started on Twitter. So here's the problem, local. Mm -hmm. Every time I bring up some fucking straight fire player who is famous, has some behavior issues. Yeah. Yours, Dardock, Forgiven, mm -hmm. loads of players, right? Mm -hmm. You always tell me, no, no, but you have to understand, like, you shouldn't, like- if you have these players, they'll ruin the environment and even mm -hmm. what they bring might, you know, count, be counteracted by what they take away from the team or maybe, you know, like they, 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 they limit Compromise you in some ways. Compromise culture, long-term. Yeah, those are my arguments. Okay. <clears throat> right, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that your boy Solo is on the bench because of his player? No, hell no. No way in I, I, I can't, listen, I, can, I don't know anything. I'm just speculating now. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to guess, like, in, like what I set up. It's got to be behavioral issues, right? It's mm -hmm. got to be something like that. There's no world where Lolo is better than Solo right now. Just, there isn't a world. Solo was one of the best performing top good. laners. Yeah. You single-handedly won Echo Fox a game versus Team Liquid. Like, <laughs> yes, sure. like, it, it is definitely not play-related. No, I agree. It's like, that's a good example there of where... I actually think Echo Fox fucked up. I'll agree with you, but I think they fucked up with that benching. And here's why. Because their team right now is so bad and there's no way of saving it that the only thing you could do is put Solo in mm -hmm. and say, try not to be a massive cunt and please carry some games. Like that actually was the best strategy. That was the best win condition. Also like, so my whole argument regarding like toxic players on teams is you don't, long term you don't it'll compromise your team and also if you're a top tier team and sure. if you're trying to be a championship team like those kind of players it's really hard to have a championship team with those kind of players but for echo fox you're the fucking 10th place team like then yes like fucking play solo like what are you gonna lose you're either gonna be 10th <coughs> place or probably a little bit better ninth or eighth with solo fucking take that like i i don't understand i'll, this throw, I'll throw in a detail though which is that it's not that you can't win with toxic players. It's just it's way harder. And the reason I think it's way harder is because you have to find... You know what? I'll go ahead and say it because I can say shit like this. I'll tell you who's a toxic player who would have fucked up. His name's Reginald. This motherfucker was toxic. Now, to be fair, he did literally own the team. So to be fair, in his brain, I'm sure it was very hard to separate the guy who owns the team and is your boss mm -hmm. from the guy who's another player in the game. I bet that was very difficult and he was a young guy. Mm -hmm. but, I take, but if you notice the way that he played in his teams, mm -hmm. I always said this, one of the reasons they won is because he was smart enough to know if I actually had double lift on my team when I'm playing, mm -hmm. I'm just going to fight with this guy all the time. If I have St. Vicious, who by the way, I always thought was better than the odd one, mm -hmm. We're just going to be arguing with him all the time. There There's going to be no shot calling. So the best mm -hmm. way to have good shot calling and for this team to work is everyone else has got to be sort of a guy who isn't going to argue with me and lets me be the boss. It worked though, temporarily, you know. So Saint and Andy used to be on the same team together. There was an original iteration of TSM where sure. Saint and Andy played together. And I can confirm they did argue all the fucking time. Of course. Time. They argued all Think the fucking Think about Saint as the person. Saint argues with everyone. Like, not even in a harsh way. He just does it. It's like, he doesn't talk. He just argues, doesn't he? Yeah. That's the way he is. He got, he's gotten better. He's gotten better. He's a lot more chill now. But, oh man. So, another thing about Echo Fox, though, is the Liquid deal. Holy fuck. Team Liquid. In fact, did you know you were actually recruited as a coach to TSM? Because obviously, Reginald, like, initially didn't want to have to have you argue with him. It's because he saw you drinking some Soylent in the interview. He goes, that's the guy for me. Get in here. He's got, what's he got a lot of girls he's friends with, but not dating. There's my guy. Bring him in. And then at any point in time, when I think that he's not doing a good job, out comes that fucking crook from Vaudeville. <laughs> and then, oh, I put on my coach. Time for Coach Reginald to take this motherfucker to the playoffs. Oh, damn. You didn't give your two cents. What do you think will happen regarding, like, the Andy-Tony relationship, like, in the future? Like, we talked about it a little. Oh, like I implied, I kind of think, unfortunately, it will ruin it. Mm -hmm. I think that's not... A Here's the problem with that move. It's kind of like what we just said about Echo, Fox, and Solo. Mm -hmm. It's a great short-term move. It's worked almost every single time Reginald's done it. The problem is... In doing so, you destroy all credibility of the coach and you basically dissolve the coaching structure. So the problem is, like you alluded to there, it's fine if at the end of the season he's decided already to fire Zix and he's going to get someone else. Mm -hmm. That's okay. He's just trying to save this season, right? Mm -hmm. My problem is, if he then plans on putting Zix back in charge next season, mm -hmm. I feel like you've got problems. I mean, listen, you were in that position yourself. Yeah. It's hard to ever really win the like respect back, right? 
Would you so, say so? Would you disagree? No, it's definitely hard. And especially if I'm not sure if there's arguments with player. Like back then, like that was me and Bjerg arguing all the time. And Bjerg won the argument by having Andy sure. come in, right? I'm not sure if it's like that internally, like if there's arguments within. That was like his equivalent of in Call of Duty when you get enough kill streak and he calls in the artillery and it's like you just win the game. That, that was what he was doing then. Like, yes. He's like, I carried the game. I played the fucking champ. That, I played Lulu. Oh, and you're going to talk to me, Loco Doco. Reginald! <laughs> but yeah, so I'm not sure if they're like, Tony isn't the t- type of person to like fight with people. And from what I heard, like, People do respect Tony within the team. So I, I was shocked when I heard Andy's coming in. And I was shocked when they were being public about it. Maybe it's completely different. Maybe Andy's just sitting in the back and letting Tony do his thing. But yeah, it, it can't be good. I'll also say as well, the pressure... I don't actually know if... There were, I'm trying to think of different teams that TSM's had. I don't think in, in context there's ever been a TSM team that had as much pressure as this one now except last year's, the one before with the Sven and Mithy one. Yeah. That's the only other one that would be comparable because people like Sven, let's be real, he must know that this is his job on the line. Like, if he keeps having bad games, he's not even from NA, dude. Like, he doesn't want to be here. Him home. He doesn't want to be that, here, that, too. That, that could I, be true as I well. I truly I believe know. that now. When we did that episode with Crumbs, before that episode, I was like, why is Zben so bad? Like, all he does is play video games. Like, he's such a grinder. Like, he's been so good in Europe. Like, he's... He was the best in the West. Like, why is he so bad? Yeah, he's like Cam Newton. He used to be the fucking boss. He was just carrying shit. Now where yeah. is he? Just a bomb, <laughs> isn't he? He's just, he's just crying. And then Crumb said it. He doesn't want to be here. Like, he doesn't want to be here. That's what, like, and I, I, it's speculation, but I do believe that speculation. It seems like he doesn't want to be here. Else, why would he be so bad? Like, this guy is a fucking amazing player. It's, uh, I... Well, especially because, remember, the problem that people like Sven and Mithy always, always had, this is one reason, in my opinion, I don't know if no one ever brings this up, but a real reason, I believe, that, that European imports often are the best players. Like some of them are, like, obviously, the Midlanders now in EU mm-hmm. in NL, NLCS are all EU, basically. But the reason why I think some of the big names fail, like Febervin's an obvious example, there have been others, though, Yellowstar, is I believe because they only went there for the big cash check mm-hmm. and to get, like, paid... That's a bad reason to join a team. You're supposed to join a team because you want to play with this guy. You believe in this. Mm-hmm. You, you, and you want to be committed long term. Mm-hmm. Like if this goes well and I'm from Europe and I join TSM, well, best case scenario, I might be there five years. I might be there 10 years like Bjergsen, right? Mm-hmm. That's the, the problem is I think a lot of these players think to themselves, yeah, if things go great, it'll be cool. But you know what? Second it goes bad, they'll always have me back in Europe. That's a bad mentality to have going into something, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a reason why there's a famous story. Apparently, it's not entirely true, but it's a great context. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but you know Spain conquered most of South America. Mm-hmm. Like South America, compared to Spain, by the way, is an enormous continent. Yeah. It's massive. And the famous story that apparently is apocryphal is that, con- that, is that that conquistador, Cervantes, I think it was, or what his name was, I might have got that name wrong. I can't remember. But the guy who arrived famously, supposedly only had like 300 men and he conquered like like the Mayan civilization, dude. They were like millions of people, the Aztecs necessarily. That was like millions of people. And the reason he was able to do that is because the first thing they always say he did in this story Mm -hmm. is once they landed, he burned their ships so that they could never go home. The only way they could survive was hacking their way through every motherfucker there, stealing all their gold, becoming the fucking gods this, and then getting back to Spain. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that that's the best case, but you can see why there's like that would work. It's an effective strategy. So Zven needs to tweet, Europe fucking sucks. I am never going back there again. All these European teams can fuck off forever. TSM for life. That's what he needs to tweet. He just needs to tweet like NA over EU. Oh, no, no, he needs to tattoo it on his body, oh. like a prison tattoo. Like, you know Gucci Mane, when he's got that fucking, like, like ice cream cone on his face? He needs to have NA over EU right on his motherfucking grill. Oh, my God. Because that way you can never go home. You can also never get a job at Target, by the way, but, you know, which might be a concern for him as well. What? <laughs> Just saying. Damn. All right, we touched TSM, we touched... Who have me touched? Oh, one thing I want to talk about for TL, I think TL, one thing I would love to see from them this week, they play TSM. I just want to see a glimpse of playoff TL. They honestly haven't shown us playoff TL in such a long time. And I'm not, I'm not going to make the mistake of saying, oh, TL is bad. Or what is it? This is TL's actual level. I still think TL is by far the best team. 
but they at least need to show us a little bit of, hey, this is who we actually are. Dude, the craziest player in Team Liquid still to me is fucking Jensen. Because you know that joke I said, that when you have a winning team already, all you say to Jensen is, you don't even have to carry like you did in Cloud9, just be slightly better than Paul Belter. Mm -hmm. It's like he took it too literally. When he's in LCS, he's like, right, you know what? Kick back, I'll do a few hours work, you know, whatever. Like, call me when it's MSI or Worlds. And when mm -hmm. it's MSI or Worlds, he's like, back to Lissandra, eh, bitch? Like, the training weights <laughs> come off. All of us, like, you know, then he just goes fucking ham, doesn't he? Because, I've, dude, I'm telling you, since he's been in Team Liquid, mm -hmm. I've almost never seen him go ham in LCS. Like, he always does a good job. Mm -hmm. He always does go in his lane. He can play all the champs. But he's not Cloud9, Jensen. Like, that guy mm -hmm. used to be a fucking stud. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that Jensen still exists, but only in an important situation. In an unimportant situation, that Jensen just doesn't come out. Like, I think that is the one player it affects them the most. I think um, Core JJ is always super consistent. X Mithy can be up and down, but Jensen's level is like up and down so much. So, I mean, by the way, mm -hmm. you know, you have to give mad credit to who? It's fucking Impact. It's like while the rest of them are all just chilling, Impact's like, right, I'll have a few games to carry then. Yeah. He's had to put some fucking good games this split and play and carry jumps as well. I think future of League of Legends looks like Team Liquid, not in terms of like how they play, but in terms of like kind of the life balance that they have. Like it seems like all the TL players like have plenty of time off. Like I see them go out, like I see them at restaurants with your girlfriends. Like they actually like, or ha they have a life outside of League of Legends. Like this 14 hour, 16 hour grind, is not gonna be healthy and it's not gonna be feasible and it's gonna weigh on the team. Yes. Like that culture cannot exist long term like look at nba look at nfl like these yes. people have wives and kids like they go to school recitals and stuff like so players well, and you also literally don't go 100 percent in every game in the regular season right yeah sometimes you have a night off when you're playing against the shit team sometimes you, you just go half speed famously mm -hmm. they do this in like the nfl and nba if you're winning a game by a massive amount you just take the fucking quarterback or the point guard or the shooting guard out don't you don't let them get injured you go fuck it we're gonna win in the game problem is there's no equivalent in esports mm -hmm. you pretty much have to try on paper and play every game 100%, mm -hmm. especially because there's no playoffs guaranteed. There's such a short amount of games. In, I know for Team Liquid, it didn't matter because they have like the luxury. Mm -hmm. But you saw for Cloud9, TSM, they still need all these wins. These mm -hmm. are important wins. Yeah. So, yeah, but the current culture of esports, especially in LCS, and I'd imagine someone in LEC is, if you're not practicing, you're wasting time. This is why NA sucks. This yes. is why we can never beat the Koreans. Like you're fucking check stealing. Oh my God, players are so lazy. Like that narrative and like the constant pressure... I think I love how TL's handling it. TL's like, we don't care. We can take regular season a little bit easy and it gets them in a good state for playoffs. Let's talk about the fine. Let's talk about the four teams that can make playoffs. So there's Golden Guardians, there's Optic, there's 100 Thieves, and then there's Clutch. And then I mean, potentially there's TSM at 9 and night that yes, can drop on the five, yeah, but, yeah, but they are two games ahead of the others. So like the yeah. odds of that, man, yeah, like you said, it's very, very low. Yeah, so... Yeah, between the four, <coughs> which two do you think will clinch? I actually am going to keep my answer the same as last time. I'm going to say I actually think it will be... Um, oh, let me think who did I say before. I imagine you said Golden I, Guardians. I think... Did I say Optic as well, though, last time? Because here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Like... Golden Guardians, I think, will listen. Mate, I, like I don't, I don't understand them myself. They just win the games they shouldn't. They lose the games they shouldn't. Like they're just a bizarre team, but somehow they do it. So I'll say Golden Guardians will. Mm -hmm. And then I'm picking basically, for my opinion, I'm picking between Optic and 100 Thieves. I personally wouldn't take Clutch. Mm -hmm. Like when I see Clutch win the game, I think okay, nice for them. But like I don't see like any brilliance in the server. So my real question, and this is where I'm going to link back to the Zabazine episode, is I actually, if I had to pick, I'd go against Optic because the problem with Optic is. They rely so much on certain players. 100 Thieves, weird as it sounds, I still think the lineup's pretty bad. But tell you what, they actually win games. Like like I said, some of the games make sense that they win. Like they actually get at least like, they get just enough from the players to allow people like Amazing to do a great job leading the team as far as I can tell. Like, tell you what, that's someone where, I've never personally said he's a shit player or anything, but he's someone where the impact he's had on his team's big time. Like if, if he doesn't join this team, let's face it, they'd be at the bottom as well. Mm-hmm. So, what a great job he's done. So the thing about Optic, though, is they're versus C9 CLG. They have the most, they have one of the hardest schedules. They're playing two and three in the league. So. Oh, they definitely don't make it. And I'll take that. I'll take that bet all day. Yeah. But they're they're one game above 100 Thief. So I think what will happen is 100 Thief probably goes 1-1. I forgot their exact schedule, but 
uh, it looked like they were going to go 1-1. And 100 Octa- Thieves players, Clutch Gaming and um, CLG. So they yeah. could win the Clutch one, potentially. Yeah. but so I think, Maybe even the CLG one, who knows, but I doubt it. So they go 1-1 and Optic goes 0-2. And I think they'll play a tiebreaker. And I think between those two, like we'll get who goes to the playoff. And GGS plays C9 and Clutch Gaming. So first of all, Clutch Gaming can spoil everything for everyone. Mm-hmm. But I, I personally would take most of these teams to beat Clutch. I don't personally think GGS should beat C9, but that's the sort of game they'll just stupidly win for no reason. So <laughs> it's not impossible. No. I could even see a world in which, are you ready? This could be prophetic. Mm-hmm. Where they beat C9 and then fucking lose to Clutch Gaming. And Hooney just goes off on Haunter. Oh my that, that's God. The world that, that's the nightmare world of watching Golden Guardians, mate. <laughs> yeah. Do you, I think that's the end of the episode. Yeah. Come on, um, I'm going to go now. Okay. We well, still did a good one. Yeah, still did a good one. Wasn't the final episode, but I, I will, I'll say this. As me, as much as like me and Thorin joke about episodes being final, every time we make those jokes, there is a realistic chance. Yeah, of course. There is a realistic chance that was the last episode. Yeah, it's, it's so, not a fair kite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one, one day, it will be a last episode. Listen, oh, yeah, probably. listen, local. Isn't under a contract, like so. It will not. You have end. to understand. Yeah. Me and Loco, like uh, this is the analogy he always uses. He's like Naruto, and I'm like this character called Sasuke, right? And basically, even though we're friends now, we will eventually fight to the death. That'll have to happen. <laughs> One day, listen, Loco, will end, and it will not be. It will not end in like that was a great 1000th episode, Dorian. Like, let's yeah. end right here. It's it'll it'll end all of a sudden because of an event, because of something. Like <laughs> our viewpoints are too different on our. <laughs> It'll, it'll end one day, but look, maybe lucky, maybe unlucky. That wasn't today. Patreon.com slash local. All right. Thanks for the episode, Duncan. I'll see you later. Sorry. Yeah, cheers, man. Thank you to our Patreons. Thank you to our gold Patreons, ButtPounder420, Tobias Bernasconi, and Icelandic C9 fan. Without our Patreon fans, it wouldn't be possible. And also, thank you to our silver, bronze, and iron Patreons, like, you guys also mean much, and without you guys, this show also wouldn't be possible. Woo, thank you so much.